TikTok, time to rock. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon to everyone who's watching from all over the world. I'm your friendly neighborhood philosopher, David Wood, and with me now is an ex-Muslim atheist, Harris Sultan. How you doing, Harris? I'm very good, David. How you doing? How's it going? And I've seen you around before. I've seen, you know, your videos popping up and so on. But I also saw recently with all of the stuff that was happening with, you know, Muhammad Hijab and Ali Dawa and all these guys that your name kept popping up. Your name kept your name kept popping up. Yeah. Uh, they were blasting you, too. And so I thought, wait a moment. If they're mad at him, <laughs> if they're mad at him. Maybe we should maybe we should uh, maybe we should talk here. And uh, so <laughs> here we yeah, are. Yeah, if they're mad at if they if they if they're mad at me, then you know I must be one of the good guys. I must, I must be one of the smarter guys. I mean, if people like Ali Dawa can go mad at you, or, or if they can disagree with you, no matter what that is, you should feel quite satisfied that you're on the good side. Because if Ali Dawa agrees with you, that's when you know um, it, 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 it's it, these are signs to worry about. Um, no, look, you know, like I mean, I've been watching what's been going on, and you know, I gotta admit, David. You are a, you are an absolute genius. You know, I, I mean, I'm a, I'm an atheist. You're you're a Christian, but I gotta give it to you. You are an absolute genius. Every trap that you've laid out for Muhammad the broomhead hijab, he's walked straight into it. He does sort like of a raging bull, like a raging bull. He doesn't know what he's getting into. I mean, I, I've been I've been looking at the number of patrons, your patrons going up ever since. The, and I I made a tweet as well. I think that got. Uh, quite a few retweets uh, where, where I tagged patron support and I said, you know, like these are just games, you know, I know these are just stupid, silly games that Muhammad Hijab wants to engage in. Um, and then your num number of your patrons, number of apostate prophets patrons, that's been going up. And that's the very thing that he didn't want. Before that, the whole, uh, you know, going after your wives and making all the sexual remarks and everything, and that also backfired. Because, you know, you guys ate the Quran. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have a different approach on that. But, you know, good on you. Good on you for standing up. Mm -hmm. And um, and that, that backfired as well. There is his own people, his own crowd is like turning uh, turning on him. Just like how they turned on him uh, on him and Yasukadi after um, this fiasco of the... I'm just going to tell you... The standard narrative has holes in it. Yeah. That was uh, you know, Some pretty big just, holes. It, everything's backfiring for them. Yeah, it's, it, 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 it's everything's backfiring. And um, uh, AP ended up getting something like 1.2 million views, and majority of them are f d showing dislikes. That shows that okay, he's gained a lot of audience. Mm -hmm. Now these people, at, you know, even 20% of these people, they're going to say, okay, what is this guy talking about? What's his problem? We're yeah. going to check him out. And they're going to look him up. And they'll be like, yeah, okay, that, I didn't know that. And, you know, every, I, um, David, I've been running, I've been focusing more on my Urdu channel for my Pakistani audience. I got 2.5 million views uh, in the month of August. Wow. Um, some gazillion number of hours. On your, on, uh, your, on your Urdu channel? On my Udi channel, wow. I got 2.5 million views. That's a lot. Uh, uh, last month, yeah, that that is quite a lot. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think uh, 700,000 came from Pakistan. Majority of them are from India, but again, you've got Muslims in India as well. But most of the people, first of all, people from Pakistan, they're too afraid to engage. They they don't hit like, or, but um, and they don't leave comments. But if I'm getting that many views from Pakistan, my view, um, my like and dislike, you know, something is not adding up. People are liking the content because I go, I, I've had, I, I get no exaggeration. I get over a thousand messages on my Facebook, Instagram, Messenger and all that, uh, mostly from Pakistan. You know, people are scared to talk about it, but they're watching, yep. they're consuming this. So when, when they're going to see someone, a big star like you or Apostle Prophet, and then they, and again, I knew that this was this was always going to be the problem with Pakistani people that they can't obviously, you know, English is not the first language, so that, they're not going to be watching it. But um, but still, it's still simple enough that people are drawn to it. It's 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 one of the silliest, it's one of the craziest jokes that's been told to people, that's been sold to people, and it's just been surviving for so long. Over, I, I just don't, I mean. Out of sheer ignorance, I think that's the or authoritarianism. That's the only thing. I mean, if people are scared. I tell the first thing I tell people when they tell me that, oh, you're just doing it for fame, you're just doing it for money. I'm like, okay, let's see. Just pretend 
pretend to be an ex-Muslim. Just go to your parents and say you've left Islam. See what happens. Mm -hmm. Let's see, you know, um, how, how, how you would feel. And then you would know you'd be scared. You wouldn't want to do it. Then what we're doing, it requires an incredible amount of courage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I've, I've noticed, I've noticed that even though they call me, um, what do they, what did they call me? This was from uh, Farid, but then Muhammad Hijab retweeted it, so I can count that as affirmation. They call me the, the world's most infamous Islamophobe. It was funny because they said the, they were, they were, they were blasting Mufti Abu Layth, and they said, uh, uh, it, you said you don't have a problem with the world's most infamous Islamophobe. And I was like, oh, cool. Who is it? I want to see. And I clicked and he, he was talking about me. So I was like, okay, so I'm, I'm the world's most Islam, most uh, infamous Islamophobe. But here's, here's what's interesting. The ex-Muslims, the ex-Muslims catch it worse than I do. In other words, they, they tend to, you know, I do the, the sort of same thing that the apostate prophet does, we both post videos, you know, criticizing Muhammad and his teachings and so on. But they, they come at him much more harshly. And I just think it's that, uh, it's that, that ex-Muslim factor that just drives them, uh, drives them up a wall. They really, really don't like that. And so it's a, yeah, I, I think it's interesting that I can be, you know, I can have my history of, you know, making Islamicize me and Muhammad's boom, boom room and now eating the Quran and they'll, they'll actually get, get more upset more quickly at an, at an ex-Muslim. And, uh, so, yeah, so. Nada. I, I can't anticipate you're, that it's a right, fun this... life. Go ahead. No, go ahead. You hear me? Yeah. You, you, you know, this actually works. Uh, pe people initially think that, okay, you're um, going that far. But any type of criticism, any kind of attention you get over your cri over, over criticizing any ideology, because if people are emotionally attached to that ideology... They're, they're, they're drawn to it. They want to mm. see that. What the hell? I thought, I thought my Islam is perfect. I thought Moh Prophet Muhammad is the greatest example of mankind. What is this guy saying? And then, and then here you are discussing his, uh, his sex slaves. <laughs> mm. <laughs> You're discussing all the, all, all the terrible things that he did in his life. And people are like, I didn't hear about this. Um, and, and a part of my show, the way I do it, and that's why I have, my engagement is so high, that I actually take random calls, sort of like an atheist experience. Mm -hmm. I take random calls from ordinary people. And, you know, ordinary people, they're, they're not as trained in debating, but, but they don't also know as much as uh, someone like me would know um, about Islam. And I just throw a random fact in front of them. And so many times they get stumped. They're like, no, that's not. I do, do. And I, then I said, do you believe in Sahih Bukhari? Yes, yes, I believe in Sahih Bukhari. And you show it to them. Mm -hmm. And they're like, uh, okay, but uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll get back. So my point is that these people are watching. So whatever we're doing, it's going to, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the latest study that's been done in, in, uh, in, in Iran. 50%, half the Iranians have, have left Islam. Uh, I, I think some, the number is something like 68 or 69 percent people who do believe in a god. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. Can yeah, you I, hear me? Is my... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw the. Uh, I saw. I uh, was it Pew Research that put out a study a while back, and then I know that Armin Navabi was talking about that. Re, was talking about that recently. I didn't see it because I think he was. I think he was uh, speaking a different language. But uh, I, I, I remember. I remember seeing people uh, passing around. Um, a, a Pew Research study on the number of, of people in yeah in in Iran, and I saw I saw similar numbers even before the rise of ISIS. I saw um, similar studies about Iraq that after seeing all the things that had ha been happening, um, the the younger generation especially was just growing up with with nothing but contempt for for just religion in general, thinking this is this is what it does to the world. And so uh, yeah, it looks like similar things happening in iran and wow doesn't i mean for 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 a religion that we're constantly there, told is about to take over the world it's not looking good from you know on the inside there it's not it, it, it's dying it's dying it, it's a diseased structure this whole structure of islam is diseased and uh, you know it's like um it's very ugly on the inside and then you they've just put it put a lipstick on it and made it try to look really pretty but it's not pretty at all and people are waking up to it it's very as i often i always say it that it's very difficult 
to sell flying donkeys and splitting moon, um, all these kind of stories in the 21st century to young kids. I mean, even if these kids go to ordinary schools where they are traditionally sheltered from critical thinking, they still have social media. They're still yeah. going to look up David Wood. Yeah. What is he saying? What is this guy talking about? Yeah. Um, you know, the one thing that I, th- I wanted to mention that people like um, how Muhammad Hijab is like, he, he, he pretends to look like a very smart person, but he's, he's a dumb brute. Everything that he's done has actually backfired so far. But I was thinking, and I, and I said that some people were criticizing you as well from ex-Muslim community for eating the Quran. And, and And I was saying that for someone like David Wood, who's the worst infamous, world's infamous Islamophobe, I think I use something like the world's worst Islamophobe, someone like him who's been doing it for what, 13, 12, 13 years you've been doing this? Mm -hmm. And after 12, 13 years, today, just recently, he ate the Quran. What was stopping him from doing this all these years ago? I mean, he could have, I mean, he could have done it like... We know, everyone knows now that if you want to piss off a group of Muslims, if you if you have an anti-Muslim immigration policy or something, all you got to do is just go to the biggest square in your city and then burn the Quran. Job's mm-hmm. done. Let, let the Muslims do the rest of work for us. Mm-hmm. They will burn the city. They will turn things upside down. And the politicians will be like, oh, shit, what do we do now? That, that, that's what's going to happen. We know that, but still... Majority of people don't do it. Yeah. But for David Wood to do it after 12, 13 years, just imagine how much this this broomhead guy, this this golden shower hijab, how much he has poisoned the discourse. And I think that's why when you keep doing it, people I, I know I know the Muslim mentality. People are cursing hijab. <laughs> people are <laughs> cursing hijab. This we, we like to find reasons to blame people. We, we like to say, oh, it's happening because of you. And people are thinking that hijab is happening because of you. So hijab, hijab is incredibly... Uh, Ali is traditionally incredibly stupid, Ali Dava. Mm-hmm. Hijab ha- is so arrogant that he doesn't realize all the, all, all the devastation that he leaves behind. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, um, yeah, al- along those lines of how easy it is to enrage people like Muhammad Hijab and Ali Dawa. I mean, I, I warned them repeatedly. I mean, if you go back to those those uh, live streams from a couple of weeks ago and we started talking about this, it's like, dude, you do not want to go down this route. You can you can shower me with abuse all day long. I'm fine. It doesn't it doesn't affect me. I can I can enrage you in in a couple of seconds. It doesn't take that long. You're you're extremely sensitive to these kinds of things. So do not go down this route. And uh, I, I really think that, that they've just seen over the past couple of decades so much that, I mean, the more terrorist attacks we have, the more, the more everyone praises Islam. Uh, even after grooming gangs, everything else, the, 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 the more people praise Islam, no matter, what they, no matter what people do. And I think it's just, it's become ingrained in their minds that these people will back down. If you just keep pushing, they just keep backing down. And so... I think it, Hijab got to a point where he said, "You know what? I'm just going to go after everyone. I'm going to start a war with everyone's wives and watch all of these watch all of these dudes back down." And uh, you, you just wonder, man. That, I mean, how do you how do you not realize it, 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 laying aside the issue of whether it's it's right or wrong, right? Even if you even if you yeah. thought it was perfectly okay, is this something smart to do? Right. I mean, if, if I'm just thinking, because if I were if I were a Muslim, it would. And I realized that in a lot of a lot of places in the UK and, and the United States and Canada, Muslims are still massively outnumbered. And therefore, it's it's in my best interest and the best interest of my community to get along with everyone else as much as possible. And if people are going to criticize my prophet or criticize my book, well, guess what? My book and my prophet call for your violent subjugation. So I guess I can't, you know, there's nothing I can do about it, really. And you'd think that that would be in their in their minds. Yes, they're going to, you know, people are going to criticize me, but my goal should be to, to get along with people as much as possible and to say, hey, you know, um, 
even though you're going to criticize as long as we don't get violent then then that's okay and that would be pretty similar to muhammad when he was in mecca people are making fun of him people are people are are are, are calling him stupid people are calling him names and so on but he's saying hey you know to you be your religion and to me be my religion he understood that's in the best interest of a community that's completely outnumbered by by non-muslims so you would expect them to get that but you just got these you got these young guys these young you know the ali dawas and the muhammad hijabs who are just uh no I'll, I'll just start it up with everyone and you'll you'll see the power of islam and and then it doesn't work it doesn't work and they can't figure out oh why is every why is everything going wrong here and uh <laughs> I, I don't i, I why don't, is backfiring what why, why are why are people lashing back when i i started attacking all their wives i don't get it what <laughs> yeah i mean yeah i don't know i don't know i don't know what goes through the heads it's uh i can i can really imagine as i said ali dawa comes across an incredibly stupid person but muhammad hijab i think muhammad hijab could be smart but he's so his head is stuck so far back up his backside um that he just can't he, he's a raging bull he just can't see he can't think clearly and and then you know like it, it backfired on him again like how embarrassing it is you you adopt a strategy i'm gonna go after their wives let's see how they back down and then he he brings his own religion into dispute by bringing abu Bakr's ravaya that how he swore at someone mm-hmm. uh, so and so um and and then he backed down minced his words back down and said um look uh islam doesn't advocate it my behavior was out of relentlessness <laughs> and, and and he ended up getting sacked from but some people tell, tell me sapiens and um i ira they're all the same but it doesn't matter who cares i've never watched them but anyway enough talking about these idiots um yeah yeah and uh as as far as you know the Ali, as far as Ali Dawa, because we talked about hijab, but yeah, Ali Dawa. The the amazing thing here is these guys, both of these guys, uh, and and to be clear, everyone, I just want to be clear a million times, uh, not talking about all Muslims here. Um, I've uh, you know I, I, I've had Muslims, I've had Muslim friends. Uh, I was friend with Nabil and and his friends back when when he was a Muslim. Um, totally trusted uh, Nabil I would have trusted Nabil with my life even even when he we was when he was a Muslim so this isn't I'm not talking about Muslims in general here but with these particular kinds of guys the Ali Dawas and the Muhammad Hijabs they constantly lie they constantly twist things um and so it it's it's a situation where you obviously have no problem lying to us and yet you're going to tell the truth about you wanting to kill apostates of all the things of all the things you yeah. decide of all the things you decide to to lay out there yep my plan is to kill you guys we're gonna have you guys executed of all the things you decide not to lie about of all the of the, of the things you decide to finally tell the truth about you pick that one that, that's amazing it's like a, it reminds me of a uh mufti abu Laith when he was making fun of he was making fun of yasser Qadi for you know t- for the holes in the narrative and he was he's cracking up and he says for 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 <laughs> for decades this guy tries to avoid controversy no i don't want to talk about the hijab too controversial i don't want to talk about that too controversial i don't want to talk about music too controversial and he says the first controversy that you want to step in is is the preservation <laughs> oh, of the quran the, the preservation of the crowd that's how i feel like ali dawa is like ali dawa you're going to spend all of these years lying about everything and the two things you're going to come out on is it's okay to have sex with a nine-year-old girl and it's it, and we're going to kill apostates those are the things you really you, you decide no nope, i'm going to tell the truth about these things it's just amazing you just wonder i mean gosh and and and, and going back to what, what we were talking about uh, uh earlier as far as you know responding to these kinds of guys there are there are weirdos that can be associated with any any position and they're you know p- people on people on the fringe so like in in Christianity, we have like the Westboro Baptist Church. These guys go around like uh, protesting funerals, and they have signs saying "God hates." God hates. Yeah, yeah, God hates these groups and stuff like that. And so, but I don't. I, I've never met someone who likes these guys, right? So they're they're out on the fringe, and we understand. Hey, this is the United States. You're actually allowed to you're allowed to say things, but you know, no, no one agrees with you, so you don't you don't really have have influence. And if if this were 
if, if in the Muslim community, this was some weird fringe and they started attacking people's wives, I would pay no attention to it. I would say, okay, these are, these are weirdos, but these are, these are popular sort of mainstream popular internet guys who are, who apparently represent organizations, sapiens and so on. And, uh, are are steadily increasing and blowing up in popularity and those are the those are the situations you have to worry that you have to worry about if you have some weird dude saying i'm going to go after everyone's wives well you know so what no one's listening to him but when the you know popular guys in whatever whatever it is if it were atheism or christianity or or islam when that type of when when that type of person who has a big following and can influence tons of people says, you know what, here's a new strategy. We're gonna start heaping abuse filled with language of rape and torture on women. That's when that's when I would sit there and go, whoa, I've had this kind of in my pocket for, for years, but I know what Surah 6 verse 108 says, and that if you're heaping abuse on someone, insulting, then if that's I- That's irresponsible. Yeah, if yeah. I threaten, if I threaten your religion with insults and abuse in return, you're supposed to back down. And so, I've been keeping this in my pocket, but I'm pulling out the pocket now. Yeah. Yeah. Look, uh, it's funny that you said that you only have Vespro Baptist Church, and we've seen plenty of those examples. And you're right; they, 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 their followers probably would wouldn't even be more than a thousand in a country as large as the United States. Um, but on the other hand, uh, let me tell you something. You, you're, you're, you're seeing this Bahama Hijab and Ali Dava guys because they are English-speaking Western Muslim apologists. There, there is a there is a real cleric, uh, so-called scholar of Islam, um, in Pakistan. When when my my Urdu channel was gaining popularity, he came after me. He couldn't. I, I just slapped him around and you know made fun of him and I, you know just. So the standard standard arguments against them, wife beating verse and sex slavery and all that. They're like, oh, how can you say this? You know, like because because they have presented a totally different narrative to the world. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so so he so he went away. Now guess what he does? He, now that guy has got two hundred fifty thousand subscribers or something mm -hmm. on his the channel. And um, first thing he does, he he finds out the photos of my mother, who's a mm. Muslim, and I've made it clear to everyone, and makes a whole one hour stream, goes through a Facebook profile, goes through a photo, clearly dog whistling. He's not swearing at her, but he's clearly dog whistling. This is his mother's name. This mm. is where she lives in Australia and all that. But, um, and he made a whole post about it. And then I knew what would happen after that. And then his his crowd was just photoshopping my mother and you know they were abusing and cursing her and all that and i'm like mm. what have i got my mom into <laughs> you know like that poor woman she's probably praying right now because she prays five times a day uh, but that's the character of these people they know that they it's a it's a false narrative they lie to people they tell people oh atheists they don't even love their parents. They don't even care about that. But they know that we do. And that's why they come after our loved ones. Um, so at that time, I felt I felt exactly like you. You know, I thought, how am I going to teach him? Because, you know, at that time, it's personal. At mm -hmm. that time, you don't oh, yeah. care about your rules and morals. And you, you said, throw everything under the bus. You're coming mm -hmm. after my family. If, if you're in front of me, you know, I don't know what I would do. But it's personal. So I thought, okay, what am I... Uh, uh, another fellow YouTubers, one of my supporters, he said, okay, Harris, we're going to threaten to, you know, pee on the Quran and desecrate the Quran or something. I said, oh, but then I thought, you know what? Go ahead. <laughs> I'm not going to stop you. He's dog whistling people mm -hmm. to hunt my family down and, you know, doing all these kind of things. But again, my point is, it's coming from a cleric, from a scholar. Yeah. Now, hijab is okay. He's, he's, he acts like a juvenile bully, but um, but this is also coming from cleric. They don't. They know that if they openly curse or swear at people's wives and mothers, it might not be a good image. But they dog whistle all the time. There's so many other examples where they dog whistle. They deliberately give out information, and they know the rest of the rest of the work will be done by the people. Mm -hmm. um, so so this is the. The, these are the low blow tactics that these people have, and they have no shame. Uh, some of them, these people, obviously. I mean, they're, they're obviously honorable people, um, like Mufti Abu Layth, and yeah. there's uh, this actor I've been speaking with, um, and th there's so many other decent human beings, and which is the reason why, and I have to confess as well, I said that to Robert Spencer as well, that I, I, delib I deliberately stayed away from you and from Robert Spencer, 
thinking that, oh, you know, these guys are Christians. I'm an atheist. I have a different narrative. But if they can see, if they can't see problem with Christianity, how can they see problem with Islam? That was my worldview. So I just never paid attention, even though your name people in, in Pakistan, they keep saying that, oh, David Wood is the king. I became an ex-Muslim because of David Wood. Smart. So that, that <laughs> oh, it, it happens. It happens all the time. Your name keeps popping up. And then I, I think the second biggest name is Apostle Prophet um, when it comes to uh, English speaking or people in English speaking countries. They say David Wood. And, uh, and it's funny that um, that you're you're also just critiquing Islam at the same time. You're not preaching your Christianity. So these people, I'm going to say, they, they, you're not turning these Muslims into ex-Muslim Christians. You're turning them into ex-Muslim atheists. It's just, it's that, just bizarre. But that, uh, so that, well done. No, I've I've been noticing that for for a long time. That uh, um, there are basically two directions. I've I've occasionally seen another direction, but you've got these guys and. Um, you know, they, they've been raised all their lives to believe in Muhammad and believe in the Quran and believe in God and believe in angels and so on. And then if you if you just go in and and wreck their belief, then even if you're going after even if you're going after Muhammad and the Quran, you, you, you've you you've got two basic options there. You, you still might believe in God and you still believe in Jesus and you still believe that God sends prophets and so on. But you reject Muhammad and the Quran. And so pretty natural for these these people to become christians um or at sort of the end of that you just you don't trust religion in general it's like wait the, these these guys misled me my entire life and you just end up with this this negative attitude towards uh towards any sort of religious claims it's all wait a minute you know it, it's all of these religious claims they're like the same kind of claims that this guy was drilling into me in the uh you know in 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 my school and so on in my madrasa and so it's uh there are exceptions. I believe Farhan Qureshi is now uh, Hindu. I think something along something along those yeah. lines. He went yeah. he went in an Eastern direction, but uh, yeah, in general, I would just just I I haven't counted or anything, but it seems like around it seems like around half of half and half of the people that I hear from, like half are becoming either atheists or agnostics or yeah, just not just not sure, not not religious. Uh, or they or they become Christians, and then occasionally you find someone who, who becomes something else. But uh, yeah, and I mean that, that that seems that seems that seems pretty natural. It seems pretty natural to to have one of those yeah. reactions. Either oh, I don't believe in that guy anymore, but I still retain a lot of my former beliefs. Versus man, I'm so disgusted with this whole religion thing. Uh, I don't want any. I don't want any part of it. Not of Islam. Not of Christianity. Not of uh, not I, of not of any of them. Yeah. I, I reckon I, I reckon the number would not be fifty fifty, but again, your experience might be different. People who are writing writing to you would be different. I, I I think overwhelmingly they turn up being atheists. But even the people who reach out to me and they mention your name, but I think why you're different is because you're not like other Islam critics who who, who criticize Islam and then in every sentence replace Muhammad with Jesus. Um, so that might not also that 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 kind of approach might also only appeal certain percentage of crowd, not over overwhelmingly. But when you go all in on Islam and the Quran uh, exclusively, that's when people go, okay, let's see what this guy is saying. And then uh, for for you know, like when I first watched your video, I don't know, a long time ago, I didn't even know you were Christian. <laughs> you were, she was just going, yeah, Muhammad. I was like, okay, I watched this video. And a few months later, I watched it again, some other video, and I'm like, okay. And then when I looked into it, then I found out about uh, Nabil and, um, you know, all, all, all your work with him and uh, about your history as well. So, um, and, and, and again, but I was obviously reading up um, reading Dawkins and you know Sam Harris and all those guys at that time, but yeah, you're right. I mean, it's quite natural. Once you go, well, if I've been lied about this, then you know what makes me think that Jesus is right or not. So, um, and that's how my journey started. I, I was, um, I always had these questions about Islam. I was a boy growing up in Pakistan. I moved to Australia when I was 19. I came here to study. I did my degree in IT, um, and. Uh, I had these questions which were suppressed. They were never, you know, funny thing is I actually went to a Christian school. All my teachers were Christians. And now as I grow up, uh, when I grew up, when I became an atheist, then I realized that those poor people in their own country, they were always petrified 
if something they would teach us our christian te- teacher was teaching us um uh, was teaching us uh, the religious studies it's you know it's not really the religious it's just like a textbook uh, uh, rel- um, history of uh, islam in subcontinent and all that but <clears throat> but but i remember this line i remember and she was she was just singing songs about the glory of islam but now i think about it and go she it must have been killing her <laughs> you know yeah. that oh these people came from arabia and they conquered india and you know they um, they came with all these good things and good teachings and people uh, found this religion to be so beautiful and then they converted to islam i i was like this must have been hurting her when she was teaching us that or maybe you know stockholm syndrome maybe at that time you know she just thought yeah maybe there might be some truth in that but the, uh, i had those questions but nobody had those answers but you, there was a culture of suppressing those um, questions and i guess which is everywhere sometimes kids are encouraged to ask questions sometimes they're not even in western countries if you have a, a very religious family people you know a, a kid might feel a bit intimidated to ask his father about um, God and whatnot, but but in Pakistan it's, it's, it's a totally different ball game, and um, you know I mean they burn cities upside, they turn everything upside down if you just say something wrong and it's going in the worst direction. Um, so when I mean when I came to Australia, I remember there was this Christian apologist. He had written a column in a newspaper, um, and I was just reading it, and he was critiquing Richard Dawkins, but he was coming from Christian point of view. And even though I had just watched one documentary of Richard Dawkins, even though I had all these questions like, oh, boy, that's too confronting. I don't think he can talk about God like that. (laughs) Even Mm. now I look back, he's one of the politest guys. But because I'm just saying that how religion holds on to your psyche, Mm. that even at that time when I watched one of the politest atheists, he's critiquing uh, Christianity and Islam. I think the documentary was called root of all evil or something in america they have a different name and i watched it i was like no man you can't talk about god like that god is love and blah 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 i turned it down and then um, six or seven months maybe a year later i saw this newspaper article and um this journalist was atta- was critiquing richard dawkins but i'm like i'm reading it i'm reading it from the journalist's point of view and i'm saying the other guy whoever the other guy is makes more sense and this is about 2005, 2006, and so internet was in its full, Google was in full glory. And then when I looked up Google, I found Dawkins, and I read, I consumed, I think, four of his books in five months or something. And uh, then I found about, so at that time I realized, okay, I've got the answers. I think I was already stepping away from religion because, you know, there was no evidence. But but at that time I, I, I could conceptualize my, my, my thoughts, and I could uh, eloquently put them in front of people so that and again Mariam Namazi is another one she in 2008 uh, I just stumbled across a BBC interview uh, uh, it was a BBC program where she was standing um, and I'm like this wow do these people exist I thought I was the only one <laughs> I was the only person who left Islam this is in 2007 and 2008 or 2007 I believe and she's talking this brave woman standing up and there's these clerics are sitting there and she's just hammering Islam away. Ham- Again, that was my shock. I was like, ooh, can you talk about Because now I was trained by people like Dawkins who were just criticizing this Christian God. And, you know, they, they were very sophisticated in their approach. And now I'm looking at Mariam. Mariam was just giving it to him. And I'm like, wow. And then, you know, that's where the term ex-Muslim came to me. And, but even then, I didn't do it for 10 years. I didn't start my activism until 2017 when I realized that so i was an atheist throughout this time i met a beautiful australian partner built a life um uh, carried on with my daytime job finished my degree in 2007 found a job everything was fine and then 2017 there was this crackdown on these poor atheists in pakistan um very the, one of the guys who ended up getting caught is one of the nicest guys i i, I have never met him but i've heard about him that his speech was so eloquent, so polite, you know, it's like literally the flowers coming out of his mouth in, in his criticism of Islam. But it was all very confined within close circles and face, some limited Facebook groups. But the government decided to crack onto them, uh, crack, um, crack down on them. And um, they arrested them. The few other people got arrested. One of the people I rescued uh, helped him out of Pakistan. And that's when I thought, you know what, this is it. 
we, we have to speak up. And one little action by them, a blogger, the shutdown, a blogger whose reach might not have been, might not have crossed more than a th- more than thousand people. That action led someone like me to come out, and I started the, and then I started a year later, I started the Udu channel. And as I said, 2.5 million views last month. Months before, I had something like 1.6 million or something, and and these views are just going up and up and up. And not only just that. I'm just one guy, but ever since I started my channel in Urdu, I think there are four more channels in Urdu that are producing quality content out there, different approach. There, there's some ex-Muslim who don't like my approach, but they, then they go to this other guy, Ghalib Kamal, and, and there's, there's another one called Spartacus. So people like different people. We know that this is human nature, but at the end of the day, what we're doing, we're all going after Islam, and it's the biggest virus in Pakistan. Yeah. Yeah. Um... <clears throat> <laughs> I do get questions like that, like, uh, David, why are you, why are you friends with the apostate prophet and, uh, Abdullah Samir? And why do you guys, why do you have these, these atheists on here? It's never crossed my mind that, uh, if I disagree with you on one thing, therefore, you know, I have to disagree with you on, on, on everything. Like if I were, if, if you, if you, me and a Muslim were in a room and the, the question was, does God exist? I would agree with the Muslim. It has some differences on that view, but, you know, it would be kind of, you know, we believe in a creator and, and you don't. If the topic were, you know, is Muhammad a prophet, something like that, then, you know, it'd be you and me and, and he's, he's the, uh, the odd man out. But when it comes to this particular issue, I mean, if there's anything that should unite various groups, it should be, hey, one thing we all agree on. We all agree, whatever else happens, we do not want to be controlled by that over there. We do not want to be mm. controlled by that over there. We see that that leads to bad things wherever it goes. And it's a, uh, I look at it as kind of, kind of, uh, it's weird because it's on a, it's on a more, a, a more foundational issue I mean, it's, it's, it's more kind of more foundational issue than other things. Whereas, you know, hey, you know, if you and I disagree on this and this and this and this and this and that, well, it, you know, it's fine to have those disagreements. We're still allowed to talk to them and so on. Whereas if you have something else that then like undermines your ability to even have disagreement or undermine your ability to even discuss or voice your disagreements, that's on a that's on a different level. On, on, on this this level right here that we're on, we can have all kinds of disagreements and we're fine and we can, you know, we can, we can, you know, res- respect each other and so on. When the claim is something that undermines our ability to even do that, then that I, I, I just, I can have no respect for that. And uh, yeah. And so that's, that's part of why I end up keep continuing to go after, continuing to go after Islam. Yeah. And then, oh, good. I remember the point which, which I missed on, so uh, which I missed earlier on. So you know, I purposefully stayed away from peop- from you and Robert Spencer, and when I had him, uh, when I spoke to him on my channel, I, I said the same thing. And um, the reason was again, okay, so these guys are Christians, you know. I'm an atheist. What, when did that become, you know, like competition like that? Fair mm-hmm. enough. I mean, we, as you said, we can disagree on so many things, but um, but then I realized that I am. So trying so hard, my whole um, movement, so to speak, my as far as I'm concerned, is to reach out to Muslims. And any Muslim cleric, even a third grade Muslim cleric who 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 you know who who can't who, who knows nothing about anything, I will engage with him in a conversation. Then why would I not engage in a conversation with people like you? I mean you you guys are so nice and you know like you wouldn't um, uh, wish anything bad on me, but these guys, people who would even wish death upon me, I'd be like, okay, let's have a chat. So, you know, that's when I realized there was a massive flaw in my own um, approach. So I thought, okay, you know, I need to speak with, um, with, I don't care whether they're Christians or Hindus or whatnot, but as long as we can just have a dialogue, that's the only thing. That's the only thing. You and I are not, not talking. I don't know how many people are watching or whatnot. Right now I'm, I'm in my room. It feels like, okay, I'm just talking to one person. Mm -hmm. But we never know how many people end up watching that and how many lives you end up touching and changing. Um, So it just doesn't matter who it is. I mean, I would speak with anyone, unless, of course, uh, uh, someone belongs to ISIS. or Actually, you know what? I I wouldn't even... 
Muhammad Hijab is such a bully. You know, this is one reservation I have with you and AP that why do you guys treat Muhammad? And I know we're going back to him, but, but I just wanted to say that why you guys treat Muhammad Hijab as some sort of an intellectual equal? Because this guy has no interest in that. He's he's actually a bully. He mm. wants to act big. I'm a big gorilla. And, you know, so what he, he should only be laughed at, mocked fun at. That's the only thing you should be doing with him. Uh, or at least, you know, I, that's what I would be. Doing. I mean, there's no point in, in, in answering to his arguments or giving him counter arguments because the guy is not interested in that. He wants to appeal to a certain crowd. He wants to appear tough. And mm-hmm. when, in his, one of his own little, uh, I, I saw one of the tweets where he, he made a video on you. He said, oh, when I beat you. And it, this is another new new freaking uh, phenomena that they just, whether you win or lose, just start pumping your chest and say, I won. You know, so the one I beat you, I was only 26 years old. And then I realized, oh, that was only a couple of years ago. So he's only, he's not even 30 yet. No wonder he acts like a juvenile brat because um, this guy hasn't matured enough. And I don't know, I think you said in one of your videos that when you look back or not, but uh, anyway, but I do think that when he looks back, when he's in his 30s, when he's calmed down a little bit, he would look back and he would be cringing. Because yeah. we've all done some things in our youth. We look back and we're like, oh, I wish I hadn't done that. I wish nobody knows about this. But but he's uh, the difference between us and him is us might be in private. We're in front of some friend. We might have said a silly joke or something or not. He's done it in front of the world. Mm-hmm. He's going to look back and his own, and I'm sure, you know, when, when Ira or whatever that organization is, when they made him, okay, put out this tweet um, that Islam has got nothing to do with it, my conduct was inappropriate, blah, blah, blah. Actually, no, he, did, he didn't say my conduct was inappropriate. He just said something along the line that I'd been going at it, it was out of my relentless and whatever. So that tweet, someone must have made him give, put that tweet out. But imagine those people, what they had to go through, but they would have told him, hey, hijab. Bro, calm down, man. This is not a good pic. Good, uh, you know, th- this is not a good picture of us. Mm-hmm. It doesn't look good on us. Um, but imagine him having to swallow his pride, and like, okay, all right, I'll do it, but just once, but on my terms, you know. <laughs> you can imagine what would be going through his head. What kind of an arrogant little, um, you know, arrogant person he is. But um, but it's, it's all gonna look very bad on you, hijab. Well, not yeah. even distant distant future. Just. Through, through a few years into the future, you'll be looking back and you'd be you'd be pretty embarrassed of yourself. Well, it's it's it, it's not going to be uh, years down the road. Yeah, I mean, he might look back, you know, years down the road and, and be embarrassed, but uh, he's going to have to sw- start swallowing his pride pretty soon here because, um, yeah, I'm going to make him. <laughs> I know I, I I know the steps I'm willing to take on this Quran, and I know if he doesn't want to, the his the other Muslims will 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 make him eventually. Uh, Take those tweets down and, and apologize. But on, on the issue of why why pay attention to Muhammad Hijab, this goes back, and, and I've talked about this on live streams before. This is going back to more more than a decade ago. One of the problems I saw was that when churches wanted to have a, an interfaith dialogue or a debate, you know, a Christian Muslim debate or something like that, they would get the you know the most uh, respectable, nice, gentlemanly Muslim speaker to, to come in there. And I, it just, I, I was just always thinking, Hey, I know Muslims who are a lot more, <laughs> a lot more aggressive than, than these guys. And when I look at, you know, the Muslim sources, it seems, it seems like, like these guys are more meant for us and not really to reflect the true sort of, sort of spirit of Islam. So when I look at someone like a, you know, a Muhammad Hijab or an Ali Dawa, I know that as, as an American, as a Westerner, as a Christian, I don't want to interact with the, the chest thumping guy. You want to, you want to marginalize and, and, you know, get rid of him and get the people there where you can have, you know, serious, calm discussions. But at the same time, I think that's part of the problem in that that is giving a lot of people a false picture about Islam, because here's the thing: you go up to to a, a Christian in in America who who uh, goes to a, a Christian church, and you start ask you start saying, "Hey, you know what? What do you think about when you think about um, a Muslim?" You might have some that say, "You know, I think of like Osama bin Laden or something like that." But if they're if they're not talking about something they saw on the news, they're not talking about something they mm. saw on the news. 
they're thinking of like, oh, you know, my Muslim neighbor on, you know, on, who, who lives who lives on the same street to me, or my Muslim coworker, or you know, the 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 Muslim I go to school with, and they're thinking of these um, very nice Muslims. And and the the problem is when I start telling them what Islam teaches, when I start telling them, hey, here's what's in Islam's most trusted sources. Here's what the Quran says uh, about what will happen to, you know, women if Islam takes over. Here's what the here's what the Quran says about this. Here's what the Quran says about that. They're always thinking, no, what are you talking about? I know all these nice Muslims. They're just not like that. There must, there has to be something wrong with what you're saying, David. There has to be. You have to be twisting this stuff. You have to be completely misrepresenting this stuff. You have to be lying because I know Muslims and they're just not like that. And so uh, basically part of the problem is I believe that a lot of people in the West, they, I mean, think about it. You've got on the one hand, the terrorists, and then you've got every the, the other muslims they know and the other muslims they know are, are nice people and so the the conclusion that that you would draw there is well the terrorists are these lunatics they're just they're just crazy right they're not they're not the real muslims these are the real muslims and so way but way back in the day i just realized we need we need some people who who aren't the terrorists but who are a better sort of reflection of the true heart and spirit of islam to be its vocal representatives in the minds of lots of people. And so when I see, you know, an, an Ali Dawa or a Muhammad Hijab as revolting as they are, and as much as we want to say, oh my goodness, please get, get rid of these guys. Please take these guys somewhere else. Please, Muslims, <laughs> do something, do something about these guys. As much as we want to recoil from them, I also want to say, no, the, the, these guys, and you know, admitting that Islam allows sex with with nine year old girls, admitting that, hey, you know, if we get a chance, we're going to we're going to kill you ex Muslims. These guys admitting this stuff and then thumping their chest and me, me strong, me crush you, me crush you. I'm looking at that going. You finished. Yeah, this is Wallah, you finished. <laughs> this is more. This is this is closer to what I read in the Muslim sources. And so I think. We at least we don't we obviously don't want all Muslims to to be to become like that or, or be a really big mess. But I think we we I don't think the the rising popularity of people like Muhammad Hijab and Ali Dawa is a bad, a bad thing in the long term yeah. because I think now people are going to be be thinking, okay, yeah, you have the terrorists and stuff, and but then you have you know my nice Muslim friends. But why are these guys so popular? Why are these guys who are thumping their chest and screaming and shouting everyone down? Why are they so popular? If Islam is really this, you know, calm, you know, reflective, contemplative religion of of prayer and worship, why are these guys thumping their chests all the time? So if that's the case. Mm -hmm. So David, you know, your worst infamous Islamophobe. Is that is that another tactic of yours? Have you employed Muhammad Hijab to work for you? Is he is he working in cahoots with you? Some uh, yeah, well, C plus O five looks like it. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll say this, he's working for me, but he doesn't know it. <laughs> <laughs> Muhammad Hijab is working for me. Muhammad Hijab and Ali Dawa are working for me <laughs> without realizing that that they're that they're working uh, that they're working for me. Now, now here's the thing. Uh, if you look over the past couple of years, right after my debate with hijab, I posted a couple of videos uh, pointing out pointing out some things. But after I realized, wait a minute, what am I doing? This is the guy I've, I've kind of been looking for, right? As far as someone who could, someone who could become very popular and is representing an aspect of Islam that people need to know about, but that is not reflected in 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 the minds of of many people. Um, this is the guy. So after that, I left him alone. I, I just left him alone. It wasn't. It wasn't really until, um, it wasn't really until the hey, I'm going after your wives now. That it's okay, hijab. I was rooting for you. I was rooting for you to become popular, but you know now you've you've crossed the line that I just the man in me can't allow yeah. can, just can't allow you to start going and heaping abuse on women. Um, yeah, can't do it. The husband in me can't, yeah, no, can't no, allow no, you. No. I, yeah. No, no, by the way, I, d I didn't mean that you shouldn't engage them like as in ignore them. No, mm. I didn't mean that. I mean, I, I, I was saying literally, specifically, I'm saying that people like hijab just, I mean, they sh we can't engage them in serious discourse. We can just make fun of them. That's what I'm saying. Just just, yeah. just, just laugh at them, make fun of them. Like, And that's what, kind, of, kind of what you're doing. <laughs> yeah. You're always poking them. And, and you know, it's like... It's like more this bear gets provoked, better it is for you. 
as, uh, you know, like if, if we just if we're just looking at it as, as, as a as a as a duel between two sides, you, you, you've got him wrapped around your pinky finger. Like, I mean, he just doesn't realize everything so far has actually backfired. And um, it's like, man, hey, hijab, can you come after me as well, please? You know, so yeah. I can. <laughs> hey, you, you know, you know, you know, it's funny because you, you mentioned earlier that he that he <laughs> that he, he just falls into every trap. And it's funny because we're, we're sitting here going live, and I know he watches them because he he he, rea he reacts to the stuff. But I will sit there and explain the entire mechanism of the trap, right? I'll say <laughs> this year, years ago, like years ago, I'm always I'm always plotting in my mind. Uh, for, I don't know for 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 some reason when I think, okay, here's a problem. Here's a problem I see in the world. Uh, if this were to be fixed in the next twenty years, what would need to happen? And in my in my mind, from right th from right here until then, it's like a bridge forms of different steps that need to that need to happen. Like it just transforms. Like I don't yeah. even have to really be thinking about it. It just goes right in my brain. Oh, if you, if you want that, we'll just 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 do this. And so a a, a a plan will form in my brain. And for for years for years, you know, I'm thinking things like, oh, here's what we need to do. Oh, we need people like Muhammad Hijab to actually uh, become the representative, so people aren't as resistant when we tell them what Islam teaches, and so on. So I start thinking of all these things that need to happen. And you know, for you know for a decade or so, I would keep these things to myself. But it was back when like. Jordan Peterson and that Milo Yiannopoulos guy were going on to college campuses and speaking and, and, uh, and the crowd would shout them down. The crowd would all freak out and shout them down. And they would say when they're being interviewed ahead of time, they would say, yeah, we're going to go there and I'm going to get up to the microphone and they're not going to let me speak. They're going to start shouting me down. They're going to scream and then police are going to have to come. They, they, would, they would say all this ahead of time. And I would go, well, they're not going to do that now because you just told them, you just told everyone what they're going to do and they can't do it. Because, I mean, if you tell me David Wood's going to do something, I'm going to try not to, I'm going to try not to do that uh, because otherwise I make you look like you're, you're, you're right about me. Um, but they would go in there and then the crowd would do exactly what they said right down to the letter. And I, I started realize, yeah. I started realizing it doesn't matter if you tell them what you're going to do. That's what they're going to do because they don't know anything else. They don't understand. They have one. Exactly. They have one methodology, right? Which is to try and shout. Which is to try and shout you down. So that's with you know the, the sort of college campuses and things that were going on over here. But then I was just thinking. I was thinking. You know, people like you know Muhammad Hijab and Ali Dawa and these guys, the more aggressive types. They only have two or three things they can do. So, I mean, I mean, I mean, just note, notice this this recent situation, right? I tell, <laughs> I tell Muhammad Hijab, take down the tweets and we're done. The desecration stop. I won't. I won't. I won't do anything to your book anymore. But if you keep it up, I'm going to keep escalating. And then he tries literally everything else he could possibly try. Oh, I'll I'll get other Christians to condemn him. Oh, I'll uh, challenge him to a fight. Oh, I'll get him demonetized. And none of this. None of this is working. None of none of it's working. When I I told him exactly what would work. And and then if you look at all these guys right now, I mean, people are desecrating the Quran. I mean, obvi I would say obviously. Obviously, if you're a Muslim and you're sit sitting back and watching this, and you see Armin and uh, AP, you know, starting, you know, desecrate the Quran hashtag and calling for, obviously, if you're a Muslim, you should be saying, "Whoa, guys, hey, hey, let, let's calm down." And what can we do? What can we do to 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 stop all of this and to dial dial things back? You want us you want us to stop being so so mean towards ex-Muslims? Okay, we're going to call on we're going to call on our supporters and followers to be nicer to ex-Muslims. If but, but if as long as you guys stop, you know, stop with the, you know, burning the Quran and these things. You would expect yeah. that, but instead, if you go you go look at the tweet, all they're doing is attacking more. And it's funny because that's all they know how to do. If there's a problem, well, you you heap abuse and start attacking and 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 insulting, and you just keep doing that. Well, that didn't work, and now people are coming at your book and your prophet. Ah, oh, well, let me let me go after them even more and heap more insults. And, and it's just like, guys, you 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 have one me you have one method that you're going with here, and when it's not working, you just keep doing it more. And look at what it's look at what it's doing. And this is something else. I've been I've been actually saying this for years. And you can go back find me you know find me saying this in in videos and live streams. But I said, because of their tendency to launch personal attacks and insults, uh, I noticed that very early in Islam when it, you could give an argument and they would try to discredit you. There's why you shouldn't. It, it's not, hey, let me refute your argument. It's here's why you should not listen to this person. This person is not a true Muslim. This person doesn't know Arabic. This person this, this person that, this person's evil, this person that, instead of actually dealing dealing with the argument. But I recognize 
because of that tendency, you can get them into a situation where you're blasting away at their profit and their book. And because that is the natural reaction for in that community, they will blast you personally. And so if you can get into this cycle where people blast their blast away at their book and their profit, and they blast you personally in return, well, as long as you can take a lot of abuse, they lose that. They're going to lose because at the end of the day, I'm not I'm not essential to Christianity. You're not essential to atheism. We could disappear. That doesn't affect yeah. atheism and Christianity. Well, Muhammad and the Quran are pretty essential. So if we're blasting away at what is essential and foundational at your religion, and you're blasting away at all these inconsequential things, it's like it's it's like if you know if two countries are at a war and one says, "Hey, I'm going to destroy their centers of production. And I'm going to destroy this," and the other one's just firing missiles off into deserts and stuff. It's like what you, you, you're going to you're going to lose. And so it's recognizing that situation. And yeah, and hijab just, it doesn't matter. It's just, hey, what do I want this guy to do? What do I want this guy to do next? Okay, here, I could do this one little thing and then he'll do it. Bam, ah! And then he does it and it's uh, it's pretty amazing. David, well, you know what, the, what, what What these people, what these clowns are not realizing, the biggest thing out of that, obviously they don't want to seem like, oh, we're backing down because David would put an ultimatum on us. So that's why we're not going to do it. We're going to do everything else, but we're not going to do this. So what happens, David Wood doesn't care. David Wood can do this for, I don't know, next three years, you know, if he has to. Yeah. But David Wood does it. And then what happens? So many other Muslims are going to see it. People who are just bystanders, innocent bystanders, they look at it. They're like, yeah, OK, he's done it. And then look at, oh, Norway, another one has done it in Norway. Oh, someone's done it in Sweden. Some ex-Muslim has done it. They're getting desensitized. So Islam also it relies on the fact that Muslims are emotionally charged with this ideology. And now what they're not what they what they're not helping is that they're helping us, or probably more so people like you, brave people like you and Armin, disconnect this emotional connection between between Quran, Islam, Muhammad, and Muslims. That's that that's another thing that's worked. So it's win win for you. So not only that they you can keep doing it for infinite amount of time, as long as you live. And then these guys are just ramping it up and they're also themselves. And, and another big why blasphemy or, or sometimes extreme blasphemy is very useful. I've had plenty of messages from people because, you know, Islam's biggest strengths are turning out to be its, its biggest weaknesses. For example, suppression of freedom of speech in incalculable amount of lies and st storytelling that, oh, Muhammad was so nice, this woman used to throw rubbish at him. And he one day she didn't throw rubbish at him. He went up to find out, oh, why did you not throw rubbish at me? Oh, she's sick. And then started looking after her. And then she turned into a Muslim. Oh, the dear Muhammad, what a lovely character. All, always old ladies involved. Um, turns out to be a lie. When I tell them to people, they're like, oh, what? Okay. So Islam's biggest strength is turning out to be its biggest weakness. Preservation of the Quran. Why meant a lie? To begin with, because now, you know, when I was growing up, everyone, even these clerics, hafizes, people who memorize the Quran, they used to say that not even a dot is out of place in the Quran. Mm -hmm. And here we have freaking holes in the narrative mm -hmm. of the Quran. When So these lies are turning out to be uh, are blowing up in the face. Of, where, where, for example, Christianity doesn't even have a claim as stupid as that. You know, they're like, OK. So it doesn't matter when you, Christianity might have other weaknesses. That's fine, but but and maybe that's why Christianity has been weakening. But Islam was so strong for so for such a long period of time because of these very few things: emotional connection between Muslims and Islam, preservation of the Quran. It must be from God because what other book can be preserved like this? And then we're like, oh, okay, and and um, because they wanted to preserve the Quran, these verses of cutting off hands and feet and owning slaves and sex slaves, etc., they might have worked 200 years ago, but now they can't change it. They're mm -hmm. like, gosh, what do we do now? <laughs> what do we do? How do we, how do we tell these Islam critics that, oh, it's okay, under this context, it's okay to chop off the hands and feet of those who wage war against Islam. Now we have, we are, 
I mean, 100 years ago, you could say, well, if someone's waging war on you, literal war on you, then of course you're not going to give him roses. You're going to cut off their hands and feet. But now we live in such a good time, in such good times that we have Geneva Convention and we have shown that even in war, you don't torture your enemies or the enemy combatants. You don't torture them. You give them three meals. You put them in a the house. You do all of these things. What kind of a book is this? So, so these were the s- strengths of Islam that they're just blowing back in the faces. And uh, people like Muhammad Hijab are acting as catalysts. They are helping us. I mean, who, holes in the Quran. I mean, people like us, we've been, uh, pe- my, my good friend Abdullah Gondal has been making detailed videos on that for over two years now on my Udu channel as well. Uh, hundreds of thousands of people have seen it. But, but the way this one little interview, the standard mm-hmm. narrative has holes in it. Mm-hmm. Now, now, the way that blew up, and guess who's at the center of it? Yeah, <laughs> our, our golden shower boy. <laughs> yeah, and 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 that's uh, it, it's you know, you talked about uh, uh, Abdullah just going back a couple of years, but um, the people who've been doing this, I mean, Jay Smith's been doing this, you know, over over twenty years, and I've been talking about this for. I don't know, 15 years or something like that. And we just go to Muslim after Muslim after Muslim saying, look at what your sources say. Look right here. Look right there. And it never, I mean, occasionally you'll make an impact with a particular Muslim, but nothing ever becomes popularized. I mean, in other words, in other words, every new Muslim you run into, perfect preservation right down to the letter. When you're talking about that, you know, not a change in a dot, I have uh, an endless array of Muslim apologetics books and Muslim dawah books um, on my shelves that say this, not a single dot, and this is a, you know, not a single dots, uh, a dot has changed in the entire history of the Quran uh, in, in, in any manuscript, and this is a miracle. And if you, if you believe this, then, you know, you know, on the one hand, you, you'd think, well, you know, how does that, you know, is that really a miracle? It doesn't require a miracle for that, but it would be pretty impressive if human beings are yeah. copying, you know, entire books and not making any mistakes. That would be, that would be pretty amazing. Uh, but it's it's all it's it's all complete nonsense, and yeah, you've pointed it out, and and this is one of the one of the original articles I wrote on answering Islam was called I- I- Islam Beheaded, the Information Superhighway and the Death of Muhammadanism, and it was it was just about how Muslim leaders in Muslim countries have been able to keep their people insulated for centuries from hearing mm. any serious critiques of Islam and from hearing any serious presentation of an alternative to Islam. And now all of a sudden you've got the internet and they're looking things up. And now that that stronghold, what was its strength is, as you pointed out, going to turn into its weakness because it was a strength being, I mean, it's just like, you know, something like communism or something like that. If you can control, yeah. if you can control the entire flow of information, um, if you can control everything everyone hears, then you've you can control what they believe, and you can control all kinds of things. As soon as that breaks down, and some information starts getting through that through that barrier, then now everyone just very quickly stops trusting what they're told. Wait a minute, you told me all my life this, and you know I just found out th- that's not true. And something like the preservation of the Quran is a is a perfect you know example when 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 you make the you make this incredibly false claim that can be so easily refuted just by putting two manuscripts in, in front of someone's face um when you sort of that's the hill you decide to fight on this this hill of perfect preservation and you you know someone comes in there and destroys that claim well the person who comes in there and destroys that claim and shows actually you've got all these problems in the in the manuscript history of the Quran that's false you haven't just shown the person that that particular claim is false you've shown the person that he or she shouldn't be trusting the people who told told them that uh, in, in in other words if you know if there's the president of the united states and you know secret service is checking everyone at the door to make sure they don't have any weapons well all of a sudden someone in the middle of the audience pulls out an AK-47, that doesn't just tell you, hey, there's a person with a weapon. That tells you people at the door are doing a horrible job. And in in theory, everyone could have a weapon, right? Well, it's kind of like that with this. It's, wait a minute, if the people who are telling me, who are supposed to be guiding me to the truth about my religion, lied to me about that, because I know, I know they know what's in the Muslim sources. The Muslim sources are filled with these, you know, entire chapters coming up missing and so on. If the Muslim sources say all that kinds of stuff, and then they were lying to me, it's not just, hey, now that 
that belief in perfect preservation is under investigation. It's all of everything those people told me is under investigation. And that's why people are leaving Islam. Yeah, and look, you know, different things pro work on different people. For me, for example, I mean, even the morality part wasn't that much of an issue. I know ex-Muslim women are usually um, in, you, you know, they wake up to it by looking into, hang on, why is my statement worth half? And why why my husband can beat me and all, all these things. So, but as a Muslim boy, especially when you're 17, 16, 18, it doesn't matter, you know, like, I mean, at least you're at the top. <laughs> you can have four wives and unlimited number of sex slaves if you wanted to, or if you were, if you could. So you're not at a disadvantage. So for different things approach differently. And this preservation of the Quran should never really appeal to me because as you said, I've all, I, I even literally give this challenge to people who call in, in my show that what's so special about it? Okay, it's very impressive. If not even a dot has changed in the last 1400 years, that would be impressive. It still doesn't require a miracle, but very impressive. Because it, early on, it became a part of your faith that you have to memorize the verses. So because it's a part of your faith, then fair enough, you can preserve it. But still, it's likely that some, someone would have made, might have made a mistake in copying it someplace. That's what you would assume. And if that hasn't happened, they're very impressive. Well done. But, but, but it gets worse when you do see mistakes. Then you're like, oh, okay. So then there's definitely, there's definitely nothing special about your book. Mm -hmm. so, um, so I wasn't even that into it. For, for me, there were other things like, okay, well, you know, God's throne floating above water before the Big Bang. Um, you know, earth and heaven being split. Um, uh, these meteorites are actually missiles thrown at the jinns. I mean, the, the, this, kind of, this kind of crap is in the Quran. And I know that might not trouble you because, you know, you might have other stories of miracles in Christianity, but different things approach differently. But the but point is, all, when, when you have this, when, when you have this counterattack on this ideology of Islam from all angles, Bad morality. It's like it's like this Islam, this poor little boy in the middle, <laughs> and people are shouting at him. You know, women are saying, "Why did you do this to us?" Scientists are saying, "Hey, well, how could you have said this?" And then the other people are saying, "How could you have done this?" And Islam has got no comebacks. And this is the reason, as we spoke about earlier, uh, I think it was some uh, Swedish or maybe Norwegian, actually no Dutch university that did the study in Iran a year earlier. It was done by BBC in Arab countries. I think Tunisia's number went from 20% atheists, uh, atheists and agnostics to, I think, 35% or something. And the other second country was Libya. And I think that was somewhere sitting at 25, 26%. Hey, wow. something is when, happening. When I was, yeah, back in, back in the early 2000s, I thought Libya was like at 99% or something like that. Yeah, that's because of Gaddafi was, uh, you know, they, these guys, see, that's another thing. These guys don't allow actual polling. Hmm. People are saying that in Saudi Arabia, atheism has gone through the roof. Saudi Arabia is, is the most authoritarian country when it comes to religion and probably politics as well. It's the most authoritarian. You can't even ask these questions there. Um, countries like Pakistan and Malaysia are a little bit different. Yes, they are very conservative and very... Um, uh, the, but but the state itself is not as aggressive as Iran or uh, Saudi Arabia. That's why Islam is crumbling even uh, even faster in those um, in those authoritarian countries. But it's like, but Pakistan has what 220 million people, 200 million are Muslims, and now they're just becoming more and more radicalized. Now, now they've just started passing laws against Shias, which make up about 15 percent of the population. Uh, what's going to happen? Where are they going to go? Um, they're just going to keep fighting with each other and people are going to, because human nature is, we create, we, we demand, our, our existence demands peace. You know, we, we don't want to be in a conflict all the time. Um, and, and that's why when people, are, when enough blood is going to be shed, when, when these, when, what they're doing, they're literally killing each other. Now a Muslim is killing another Muslim over blasphemy. Now to them, they, they see, in other countries, Arab countries, they don't take blasphemy as seriously as they take um, as they take uh, apostasy seriously. Mm -hmm. In Pakistan, it's reversed. They don't take apostasy as seriously. They say, "Well, if you're ex-Muslim, go, go. I don't care, but don't, don't you dare say anything about the, our prophet. 
That's where they go. So over there, you literally get killed. Um, uh, so they have a totally different attitude. But what, 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 what happens? Nothing stays the same. Nothing. It always evolves. So they, some genius in Pakistan in the 80s thought that, okay, we're going to put a death penalty over blasphemy. But they know that the law is pathetic. That's mm. why over 1,300 cases, not one person has ever been hanged in Pakistan over blasphemy. Never. Because they know that they can't hang people over this. They, they, they know it. Um, in, in return, they've, hung, they, they, they've hanged plenty of people, uh, plenty of murderers, but they mm. haven't hanged anyone over blasphemy. So the state knows, government knows this is pathetic. But what happens? Because you made this official policy, people get charged up. Now, you say, oh, why did you say... So there are different levels of referring to someone in Urdu. Uh, for, for you, you say tu. Tu, you can say for a younger kid or someone with disrespect, you can say tu. But for someone with respect, you say ap, meaning then that's for profit. So if you use someone like tu, the word like tu, that you would use for a kid for Prophet Muhammad, therefore that's blasphemy. We can put you in prison. And if you haven't hanged him, then what's the state doing? And then people become vigilantes and then start taking action into their own hands. Last week I, I reported on this. Uh, a, a, a person who, who's a memorizer of the Quran, he knows the Quran off his heart. He got killed by his fellow security guard for over blasphemy. Now this guy got, who, who got killed would have been the would, would have loved the prophet like like anyone. You know, like as, as any normal Muslim would. Um, but he got he, he also got accused of blasphemy and he got murdered by his by his own friend. And that's the frequency has. Increased. Oh, actually, here's an interesting stat. In last month alone, ever since that U.S. citizen was killed in Peshawar court, I don't know if you heard about him. He was killed in a Peshawar court. I reported on quite uh, quite a few times. So last year, I think at the end of um, July, there was a U.S. citizen, Pakistani U.S. citizen. He was lured back to Pakistan mm -hmm. and um, uh, to have some sort of conversation, but it was a trap. And then as soon as he got there, they arrested him. Uh, he's been going to court since 2018, but nothing was coming off it, obviously, because U.S. had his foot up Pakistan's backside um, uh, that they had to release him. They somehow, you know, they get themselves in this mess because the law exists and then they cave into the international pressure. So nothing was happening. He was probably going to get released. So this vigilante goes in, uh, some 16, 17-year-old kid, killed poisoned court, by... Right? Yeah, killed him in yeah. court. That happened on 30th of July. But since then, in the whole month of August, we have 32 reported cases of blasphemy, which is the biggest number in the history of entire Pakistan yeah. in one month. You would get one a month, maybe one every two months. But they are getting so charged up. And I think this is just that just before we see start seeing even bigger number of uh, apostasies coming out of Muslim countries, just be aware that there's going to be some bloodshed. And my friend predicts that, uh, especially in Pax, some, some Pakistanis, I mean, I, li I live in Australia, I take my security quite seriously, but there's some ex-Muslim YouTubers who are not in Pakistan, but they are not in very uh, well-off countries either. So the, he's made a prediction that one of the popular ex-Muslim is going to get killed as well, mm -hmm. because that's likely to happen. This beast is not going to die without showing his teeth. Mm -hmm. And um, as I said, we, we're seeing in Pakistan, we're seeing this increase in frequency of blasphemy, murders, vigilante actions. Um, but again, I think we will, in the, within our lifetimes, if we don't get murdered, we, within our lifetime, we will see a very sharp increase. And we're already seeing it. Half the people mm -hmm. in Iran, come on, Iran, Iran, go tell Obama, <laughs> or George W. Bush who called it axis of evil. Half the Iranians are believe in Islam. What more, what more could be better music to your ears? Yeah, um, and I, I think there's a there's a parallel here uh, in that lots of the lots of the people I've known, including Nabil, who've left Islam, they they seem to go through this period where, as their doubts increase, they become more devout. Um, mm. 
And and so, you know, I, I hear from Christians, hey, I'm witnessing to my Muslim friend, and the more I talk to him, the more devout of a Muslim he's becoming. I say, that mu- that probably means you're getting to him. And he's trying to compensate because he's feeling bad that he's having these doubts. And so he's trying to compensate by being a far more a far more uh, faithful Muslim. But, I, you know, so I've seen that over and over and over again. That it, it, Because what happens is... Um, they have a lot of confidence in Islam and then you, you know, you spend, you know, months or years giving them information and you see they're learning all of this information that they, they've never heard before. And all of a sudden they start dressing more conservatively and going to the mosque more. And, and, and you're, you're like, gosh, is after, after everything I, you know, I've shared with you, that's, that's what you're doing. And it's, it's kind of compensating, you know, it's obvious, obvious that they're compensating because after that, all of a sudden, Hey, I just left Islam. Um, and so what, but what I think you have is you have a similar parallel in, you know, the Muslim community in larger Muslim communities when, as they're, as they're encountering all of this new information and as they're realizing, Hey, we've got all these problems. And as they're, you know, able to see opposing points of view and as they're able to, to have their beliefs criticized and so on, that, their their confidence is being shaken and people are leaving and so on their confidence is being shaken and so they have this this urgency that ah we must become much more devout right now just as an individual has that reaction it's ah we're getting shaky here we need to crack down and become more devout and i think i really think that's what you're seeing with the rise of you know the, the you know people like muhammad hijab and so on is uh their confidence is being shaken I mean, just look, I mean, there's no coincidence that you had the holes in the narrative. People are going to Yasser Qadi. They're going to Muhammad Hijab. You're destroying my faith in the Quran. What's going on? And then all of a sudden, I will crush all of you. I'll destroy all of you. I challenge all of you ex-Muslims. I will shout all of you down. And it's, uh, you know, it's, so I'm, I'm, I'm looking at that. And I'm going as, as, as horrible as that is, I get it. I've seen this before. I, I saw it in individuals. Now I'm just seeing it in a, in a community. As I said, it's, it, it is a win-win for us because, you know, look at Muhammad Hijab himself. We keep going back to this broomhead guy, but uh, he, he, speaking with apostate prophet, him t- saying that, oh, no, hang on, wait a minute. I've been thinking a lot. I'm, I'm paraphrasing him, and I'm actually yeah, thinking out his, um, speaking out his thoughts aloud as well, that I'm, I've been thinking about this. You clever ex-Muslims have been getting me on this apostasy issue, and then you show our... our ugly face of our religion to the world here's here's the nuance on this in perfect islamic society we used to say in perfect islamic society they they should be they should be killed but now they should have treaties with other western countries and they should be given an option to exile Mm -hmm. that by his standard that's a huge leap forward but by our standard it's still a fascist ideology Mm -hmm. that's exactly guess who said that Hitler said that about Jews. Wow. Mm-hmm. Should we exile them or we should should we kill them? So, but having said that, my point is, hijab is like he's still trying. They're still trying to change so much. And guess what? The the demon, the Frankenstein's that they've created themselves. Somebody sent me. Somebody actually tweeted it. There were hundreds upon hundreds of comments where people were bashing him for saying, "Oh, well done. You beat apostate prophet." You know. You gotta say that whether you lose or win, you just gotta say, yeah, we won. So anyway, so he said, you well done, you 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 beat apostate prophet, but bro, you're not. This is not right about apostasy. You gotta mm-hmm. kill him. Yeah. <laughs> so, so so someone as radical as Muhammad Hijab is now saying, oh, okay, we gotta give them an option of exile as well, um, and then. We are forcing them to change the narrative, change the stance. Um, Ali Dawa one where he said, uh, if my daughter is whatever. It, the, again, as, Ali Dawa is so stupid. This is a trap that people are, uh, are setting for him, and he just keeps walking into it. And how could he not walk into it? Because if he doesn't say it out loud, then he's publicly saying that, well, maybe Muhammad was wrong in marrying a nine-year-old girl or some other kind of, or, or maybe outrightly deny uh, that. But then we know once people start denying that these, then they dig a bigger hole for themselves. And which one do you believe in? And why should we believe in your good hadiths? Um, and so um, he, he, these guys just keep walking in the traps and we just have to, and we don't even have to be, uh, ha- we don't even have to have Einsteinian intellect to work that out. You just ask Muhammad, 
Uh, for example, there was this guy, he had a PhD student. I had this debate with him in 2018 uh, in the University of Sydney. Um, I had a debate with him, PhD student um, uh, in philosophy. I had a debate with him. Fair enough, he gave all the fine-tuning argument. I gave the traditional atheist argument. He gave the traditional God arguments, whatever. But I was like, yeah, you know, people are not finding interest in that. I just asked him, uh, what is the punishment for apostasy? Mm. That was it. He, there, there was white audience sitting in front of him who were being mesmerized by his, oh, the fine-tuning argument, oh, the onto, ontological argument, oh, this guy's got... But now, what is the punishment for apostasy? <laughs> and he's like, uh, uh, I think you can watch the video. It was actually picked up by the local newspaper, um, actually by Daily Mail, not the local newspaper. And the clip went on for five minutes. He could not give a straight answer, but just at the end, he's like, yeah, you should be killed. <laughs> wow. so, so, so these are the traps. It's so simple, so easy for us to lay it out for them. Yeah, the, uh, what, I, what it looks like in, in my mind is um, it's a similar situation. I brought, I've mentioned this in the past, but uh, the, at the, the, the time of Philip of Macedon, um, yeah. the Greeks, Alexander's father. Yeah, the, the Greeks were pretty, pretty scared of the Persians. They understood that when the Persians come over to conquer us, if we all unite, we can, we can take our stand and make them go back to where they came from. But they still viewed the Persian Empire as this, you know, massive, powerful empire. And then so during the time of Philip of Macedon, these travelers kept coming back going, you know, these Persians that you're, you're, you're so worried about their 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 forts are falling apart their soldiers are lying around drunk i don't think they're they're as as strong as you really think they are and if you if you have a pretty well trained army well disciplined army you could just go wreak havoc through through all through all these guys and alexander the great said i'll do it and just they, they put destroyed up, him yeah, yeah. yeah like like it like like it was nothing and that's how that's kind of how islam looks to me it's be, specifically because they've built they've built people's confidence in their religion upon these pillars of lies, right? If they had been honest about the holes in the, you know, the holes in the narrative all the time and just said, hey guys, you know, it's not a perfect process. Anytime you have human yeah. beings involved, it's not going to be a perfect process. Yes, yeah. it was perfect when Allah revealed it, but then it's in the hands of the human beings and human beings make mistakes. And so of course you're going to get differences in the manuscripts, but we still, you know, we still believe we have an accurate reflection of what was revealed to Muhammad. And so yeah. we believe in that. If they had said that, then that would be one thing. But because they ha they have to make up all these claims, right? This The Quran is a scientific masterpiece that's filled with these insights that are only being verified today. That sounds great as long as you know no one's going to go look it up. Uh, but, you know, you have pillar after pillar. Muhammad is the greatest man who ever lived. His character was perfect. The Quran is filled with these scientific insights. Uh, the, the Quran has been miraculously preserved right down to the letter. And, and every Muslim you go up to, he believes in Islam because of these things. And it's just looking at this going, these things are so false and they're so easy to refute that if you have a small, well-trained, well-studied group who knows how to just wreak havoc on these basic beliefs, uh, you can you can go through there just like just like Alexander went through the Persian Empire and just just wreak havoc. Yeah, on that. Uh, look, yeah, you hit the nail on his head. I mean, as I said, the biggest strengths of Islam are turning out to be the biggest weaknesses, but only in the 21st century. As I said, if minus the social media, as you said, if you're not going to look it up, it's, it's perfect down to the letter. No one's going to look it up. Or if, it, oh, there's scientific miracles in the Quran. If you don't know science, fine. Then you take the claim. You're like, okay, that's fine. It must be from God. But now in the 21st century, it's very difficult to maintain that lie because someone can just look up what is the Big Bang Theory. It, the, the Quran is saying that earth and heavens were together, but there was no earth at the time of Big Bang. What is he talking about? And God's throne above, floating above water with that. So, you know, so people can look it up, but it worked. It worked back in the day in the pre-internet era when people, you know, like only this very few smart people would go and go to a library and they would find one book that is actually critical of Islam. But guess what? That book has mysteriously disappeared from the library as well. So that would have worked up until I would say even up until 90s as well, it would have worked really well. People like Salman Rushdie and so many other great ex-Muslims, Ibn Warak, etc., um, who, who've written about it. But their books were, were, were made, they, they were so 
um, uh, you know, uh, demonize these guys. That I, I, when I grew up hating Salman Rushdie, I had no idea what's in that book. <laughs> it was like just, oh, oh, this guy's he's gonna burn in hell. Guess what? He's freaking still alive, and you can't do anything to him. And um, and then people are not gonna read the book, and they're just gonna go go on with with their, with their merry life, and they're gonna say like everything's fine. But now, how are they gonna how are they gonna look away when you just watching a Turkish TV drama serial where, where, where you're uh, fantasizing about your glorious Muslim past and then a video comes up of David Wood eating the Quran like this. What are you going to do? You're, you're bound to click on it and then you might feel angry as you're right and then people do react. This is a survival mechanism. They go like, oh, I have to hold on to this faith. You're right. I mean, these people, I've, I, I've, I lost count of people who used to, because I, I never, I very seldom delete messages from people unless they actually tell me that please Harris delete it in case your account gets compromised, I'll get compromised in Pakistan. So I, I seldom delete their messages. I, when someone sends me a message a year later, I could, and they say, Harris, you know, like I've changed my mind, you know, like I thought I was preserving my faith, but I can't. I, I scroll up and I look at their messages where they say, um, a, 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 a year late, a, a year ago, they were abusing me. They were cursing me. They were saying, "Oh, how dare you!" Blah blah blah. And a year later, they've changed their mind. Mm -hmm. Why? It's only because of social media. If it was just my yeah. book, if it were, if it was just my book, reading a book is difficult. You know, yeah. finding it is even harder. Um, so it's easier not to look at it. It's easy to hold on to your faith. But now these guys, we we're in their faces, and I think this is what what frustrates people like. Um, Muhammad Hijab, and he they act out, and I think it's frustrating the civilized scholars as well, like Yasser Qadi and Shabir Ali and these guys. I mean, Yasser Qadi, I noticed the other day, he just blocked me on Twitter. <laughs> you know, I've never been, I've never been disrespectful to him. I've never, you know, uh, I've always been respectful whenever I've addressed him. But you're finished. But these guys, <laughs> yeah, you're finished. Wallah, you're finished. And, <laughs> I, you know, like. This is how crazy they are. That's how far they go into their their um, obsession, this OCD. Muhammad used to do things three times, right? He would wipe mm -hmm. his bum three times. He would mm -hmm. knock on the door three times. He would eat three dates, and everything is three, right? He was massively, he was massively OCD. Yeah, massively OCD. But look at Muhammad Hijab. These guys who emulate them, he also he also act like that. They don't. They even copy his. His, uh, his, his mental problems, like uh, Muhammad Hijab is saying it three times, well, are you finish, you're finished, you're finished. <laughs> it's, just, it's just crazy. These guys are just, um, I, I think they, we're, we're living in very interesting times. I think, uh, but we got to remember one thing. I just want to say that we have so many ex-Muslims in Pakistan that if I just focus solely on reading the messages that I get from people, they don't, they don't leave it. They don't subscribe to my channel. They don't like my videos or whatnot. And they, I, I literally get thousands of messages in my messenger or my Instagram where people say, we can't say this. We can't like this. We can't because for obvious reason, but they are absolutely living in a suffocating environment. And, um, I know that you can, you can shut down a few people, but you can't shut down everyone all the time. So it's just about gaining number. And I'm very hopeful. Very soon, David, within 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 10 years, um, there's going to be 30, 40 percent uh, atheists or ex-Muslims living in every major Muslim country. So Iran is like, I mean, it's, don't, don't be surprised if you if you hear. Uh, next year that there's a there's a secular revolution in, in in Iran don't don't be surprised if that happens I mean if 50% of the people the study that they did and the sample size was 50,000 that's very big by any standard and mm -hmm. um, and it was very diverse group of you know, it's a proper university uh, uh, study not only just that the, the, the lot of people that are actually becoming anti-theist of course when you're taking away their freedoms when you're forcing, and I said, all these people, all these Western feminists, when they say, oh, hijab is a symbol of uh, freedom of women, and it's a symbol of feminism, etc. It sure is. Imagine those 50% imagine ex-Muslims living in Iran, those women. Imagine those, they have to wear a hijab because it's compulsory hijab in, in, in Iran. That's why we keep seeing these videos coming out where, where, uh, where an ugly mullah would go up to a to a to a to a girl and say, "Oh, I can see a strand of your hair," 
and then mm. they would start this the, 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 this whole uh, uh, this whole fight in the middle of a street, mm. and then everyone would side with this cleric. And imagine being that woman for one moment. And if 50% have left Islam in 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 in, um, in Iran, 25% of them would be women. That's in that number is in millions. Then millions of women are wearing hijab when they don't believe in it. So, um, you know, it, we, we have to, I mean, th that's one thing that I just keep thinking about those people. And those are the people that keep giving us courage for uh, keep doing the work we're doing. And um, I, can, I can only thank you enough because whatever voice that we get, that was my problem for a bit, bit of time that, okay, well, we're ex Muslims, we can take, and we do get away with a little bit more. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, then someone who is coming from a white background, Western background, and mm -hmm. non-Muslim background, it's easier to stick the label of Islamophobe or racist with you, for mm -hmm. instance, as it is with me. I, I do get away with a lot more, um, but that was the flaw in my thinking as well, and some ex-Muslims thinking as well, that, okay, we can criticize Islam, it's our mess, but how, oh, you're white dude, why are you doing that? You're, you must be racist, you must be pushing your Christian agenda. You must be pu pushing your non-white immigration ban agenda. Mm -hmm. that, that, that kind of it, and, and look, they can't, we can't be totally blamed because there are some people like that as mm -hmm. well. But it's very important to, to differentiate between those people. That who are they? Mm -hmm. Is it, is, is it uh, Richard Spencer is a clear Nazi, but Robert Spencer is not. And this is why I have a problem when, when you call these names loaded terms to people like Robert Spencer, then what's the difference between Robert and Richard? And we know Richard Spencer is a Nazi. Robert Spencer is not. So, But you've equated them both the same, so it loses its meaning. So we have to be clear with, uh, with the real genuine critics of Islam. You're a critic of Islam. You're not a bigot to me. I haven't found anything uh, that would suggest that. But then why should, what, what reason do I have not to talk to you? Because I'm a critic of Islam myself. We're both the same. Um, so anyway, we're doing great work, and I'm uh, really, really glad that I got an opportunity to come to your show. Yeah, um, th that's something that's always, I mean, it, it's kind of diabolical, the way people get lumped together. Like, I've never, some people may be surprised to hear this, I've never criticized uh, Muslim immigration. I've criticized being stupid about it. If you're saying, hey, we're going to bring in uh, a bunch of Muslim refugees from a country, and... <laughs> Uh, you look at the people and they're all like 18 to 24 year old men, I would say you're being stupid because those are the people who are best able to survive in that war-torn country. Uh, where are the women? Where are the old people? Where are the children? Those are the people who are least able to survive in those places. So why, you know, why are you being stupid uh, about this? Apart from that, uh, apart from that, I've, uh, I've never, I've never, I've never gone out saying, hey, we, you know, we need to crack down on immigration and so on. Uh, in fact, Nabil and I at certain times have uh, have been in a position where we're actually defending it in like a conference where mm -hmm. the topic comes up. Hey, should we ban immigration? And there would be there would be people saying, I mean, should we ban immigration from Muslim countries and so on? There would be people saying, uh, yes, of, of course, of course you should. Why do you want to bring you know terrorists in? And it would be you know me and Nabil sitting there, and Nabil be calling, you know, gosh, my, my parents weren't terrorists. Yeah, you might want to be careful. You might want to be careful about who you're bringing in and so on. And uh, so we'd be on, we'd be on that side. But yeah, I, I've always distinguished. I've always distinguished between here's a person, right? So. I'm a Christian, so I believe people are created in the image of God. But, you know, if you just believe that people, living people, have basic rights and so on, they're in a different category from an ideology which has no feelings and has no rights, uh, which even an average ideology is, is still different from an extremely dangerous ideology that calls for your, you know, your violent subjugation. And so there's just nothing... I, I don't get this. Hey, I'm going after the ideology because I don't. I don't just believe. Oh, this ideology is a danger to me. It's bad for the. It's bad for the Muslims themselves. It's keeping you in a. It's keeping you in a. In a. It's affecting your your thinking about the world. And I. It's not just. Hey, this is this is bad for the world. It's bad for you Muslims. I mean, whenever whenever we bring up uh, Islamic terrorism, one of the first responses is. Oh, but Muslims are the biggest uh, victims of Islamic terrorism. 
Yeah, we know Sunnis are killing Shias and Shias are killing Sunnis. We, 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 we know that. But that that's kind of the point. You're not helping your case here, right? So so let me get this straight. Belief in this guy who inspired his his even his closest companions that when you have a disagreement, you start killing each other. You can see the first the first generation of Muslims were so violent that they almost annihilated themselves, right? You had Aisha, the mother of the faithful, march an army out against Ali, the command uh, the commander of the faithful, right? And they're killing each other. And so how do you not it, it, you know sit back and say guys before we you know before we continue this campaign of violence and so on we need to sit back and decide whether this is uh this is really this is really true and so before we before we go out killing let's make sure we have good reasons and let's check out this let's check out the information we've been given has the quran been perfectly preserved uh-oh no uh, is muhammad the greatest man ever uh-oh no and then you know i i don't know how they how they don't have that but yeah it is uh i agree with you this is this is pretty much the coolest time in history as far as this goes because as long as islam had that had that ability to keep people insulated it could just expand and expand and expand until it would be stopped by you know for one reason or another but now it's crumbling from the inside and uh I don't know. It's just cool to be in this, to be part of this, right? I mean, future generations look back at this and say, "Hey, that's when that fell." And uh, yeah, these you know, yeah. these are the people yeah. on the internet uh, during this time bringing this information to people. So it's, yeah, yeah, cool time. Yeah, that that that's definitely very cool. Yeah, yeah. All right, uh, you want to take a couple questions before we sign off? Yeah, sure, certainly. All right, ladies and gentlemen, if you have any uh, questions for Harris here. This would be a good time to uh, this would be a good time to post any questions. Um, I had a uh, darn it. There were some questions earlier about stuff that was going on in Pakistan. Did you follow the story of uh, I believe it was I think it was a young Christian girl who was uh, I, Asia baby Asia. No 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 not not the not the blasphemy case. I mean the uh, apparently there was a. People just took her and force it, you know. Uh, oh yeah, did Huma. a force marriage. Huma's, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, that's just according to the study of Human Rights Watch and Hindu Council of Pakistan, and it's been published in Dawn, which is the biggest, largest circulating English newspaper of Pakistan, Tribune, uh, Pakistan. Uh, all the, all these uh, newspapers have confirmed that roughly around about thousand girls a year are uh, from Hindu and Christian backgrounds are kidnapped, married off against their wishes. Oh, obviously, if it's under 18, it's, it's statutory rape, um, and, or even under 16. But these girls are 14, 13, 14. And girls, always girls, are kidnapped, forced into Islam, and then they they paste some, they put out photos on social media, happy photos, where she, you know, they just, uh, with a new groom who's 30, 40 years old, and this 14-year-old girl, and they're just happy and happily ever after. They the, they put these up on social media. So the thousand girls a, a year get kidnapped every year. That mm -hmm. happens every year, and uh, that's just one number. Huma, I think it was Huma's story. There, there was uh, Huma. That, that's one Christian girl. I think she that happened in Lahore. There's another one, Myra. That was that was uh, that story was featured on Forbes. Um, unfortunately, that keeps happening. Courts are aware of that. But there's no legal framework. So I'll give you a bit of rundown. In 2017, uh, Pakistan's only secularist kind of party, it's not secular, but they pretend to be, but they're, but they're better than the religious parties. Um, they tried to pass a law against forced conversion back in 2017. But guess who opposed it? The clerics. They turned up, they, they just turned up in huge numbers. And they said, you're discouraging people from converting to Islam. Um, but so the, the government backed down. That was in 2017. And somebody should ask, you know, by the way, this is how hi hi hypocrite these societies are. If you leave Islam, you're allowed to, but you have to appear in a court. But if you don't, but if you, from any other religion, you come to Islam, you don't have to go to the court. You can just... You can just uh, sign a piece of paper, or uh, not even that. You can just say that I've taken, uh, I've converted to Islam. That's it. So that's the hypocrisy. So, so people were saying, "Hang on, why are you 
uh, why is this double standard? And on the other hand, we're getting these 13, 14 year old girls getting kidnapped all the time and they're converting to Islam. And the parents are protesting in front of minister's house and the, in, in front of courthouses and nothing's happening. So anyways, they tried in 2017, but good news is they just tried it. They tabled the bill, I think a couple of weeks ago. And um, I think they're just trying to just silently pass it. Uh, b before it just becomes a huge issue. So we're hopeful that this time it might get pa the bill might get passed. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Well, we have a bunch of uh, questions here. I did want to point out, uh, Eric here says, uh, the uh, Charlie Hebdo trial began yesterday. What's your uh, take about that? I've heard it would be recorded, which is a rare thing for the French judicial system. Last time it happened was a trial to a Nazi. Um, so yeah, I actually, right before... Um, we went live. I recorded a video about that. I'm probably going to post a few more. Um, so one was just a general sort of introduction to the topic of this uh, trial coming up. Um, tomorrow, I'll probably post an interesting poll, which shows that back in, I think, 2006, the poll was done in, in France about, you know, whether people thought it was it was OK to uh, post cartoons of Muhammad and it was like it like 20 some percent most people thought it was it was just a horrible idea uh, whereas after the Charlie Hebdo massacre it was I think it was about 50 percent so I have to go back and get the exact numbers but basically far more people now think it's okay to post cartoons of Muhammad than back in the early 2000s specifically because of the violent uh, the violent outbursts uh, you know and so yeah and so the, the, well, point, the point the point here is it's like Mohammed Hijab. He keeps, oh, I want to stop this. And you just end up encouraging it and making the same dumb mistake. Uh, what are your thoughts on that book? Well, yeah, I mean, see, th that, that's the thing, right? I mean, every civilization fights back. I mean, there's only so many punches they're going to take. Um, this Charlie Hebdo happened. And you're right. I, I would have thought the same thing, that people would have said, why are you provoking Charlie Hebdo? Why are you provoking a group of people? Why? Well, why? But then when they react that way, then you say, OK, you know what? Do it again. Go for it. And now they've after five years, they just republished the same cartoons. And guess what's happening and what was tr trending in Pakistan yesterday? Charlie Hebdo, shame on you. Mm. Um, and at the same time, and I got tired of tweeting and tweeting. I got tired of telling some of these celebrity accounts. I was like, not, not a single word on the trial that is happening and how many people were killed by these people over a cartoon, yeah. murdered. And you know, my, my good friend Vidu Vids, a um, uh, fellow YouTuber from England, he actually became an ex-Muslim after that. When he saw that, when he saw, and he was a Muslim at the time when Charlie Hebdo published the, uh, published the cartoons. And then, and he's, he's told this story numerous times that, uh, but then he heard when he spoke with his own fellow Muslims in the schools and friends and family and all that. He said, "They said he said every time I ask these people, my 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 seemingly otherwise humane, normal, wonderful Muslims, this every time I ask them about why did they get killed, what, what do you think about this murder? They were like, yeah, it's wrong, but.' And he said, "I have the I had the he had the biggest problem with the word but. You just cannot justify murder. Sure." There's so many other ways of protesting. Say that, you know, this is horrible, you know, we don't support that, make a petition or hold a candlelight vigil or whatever. And that way, more French would have been like, you know, we shouldn't do that to, um, to our fellow Muslim community members. But no, we're going to go and st start stabbing people. And when you do that, of course, as you said, like you're in minority, these people, and, and they're going to fight back. And France is, I think, taking the lead. There was a news story a couple of couple of days ago where a uh, French interior minister said that we're going to deport and deport the, the whole Muslim family because they shaved the head of a 17 year old daughter because she was dating a Christian guy. Um, and when, when these kind of things happen, uh, sure, it, the, you know, the, it's just a one off isolated incident. But my point, I know and every Muslim who's listening to me knows how seriously they take this honor thing. Yeah. Hundred families. If they would not have shaven her head off, they would have disowned her. Mm. 90 out of 100 would have done that. So um, not not shaving, disowning her, at least disowning her. And, and, you know, beating, slapping, all that thing would have happened. So we know that. On the other hand, 
hundred Christian families, I think maybe five or five of them would have objected to marrying a brown guy or a black guy or a Muslim guy or whatnot. Uh, and that might have been also from Vesper Baptist Church. <laughs> so majority of people would not have acted that way. Um, so these are the things, these telltale signs are so clear in, in front of the world. And they did it well for a little bit of time. Post 9-11, they ended up spreading their narrative that, oh, look, America came and bombed us and you're, you're with the victims. We've got nothing to do. So that idea of Islamophobia kind of worked for a little bit, but it's backfiring on them. Yeah, to, um, to, on them now. Yeah, me, yeah. me, and, uh, me and AP um, the other day were talking about how, how different it is with Islamophobia now in that, you know, 10 years ago, you're saying, hey, Islam calls for terrorism and it's, you know, the, you know, uh, the execution of apostates and allows sex with prepubescent girls. And then it's the response was, no, Islam doesn't teach any of that. You're just an Islamophobe. And that's why you're being irrational and saying all these false things. Whereas now it's yes of course we're going to kill you and of course you can have sex with with nine-year-old girls of <laughs> course finished. all these things but you're an islamophobe if you if you resist it and so it's like yeah. it's just a completely different uh different scenario now uh, lies don't survive david lies like these as i said the, the biggest strengths of islam are turning turning it into biggest weaknesses and we're gonna see that more and more people you know the amount of people people like you who have been doing this for such a long period of time where you just give up a reference and so many people ordinary people now they memorize the references <laughs> not only they just say hey muhammad had a you know you know muhammad has so and so sex life um that they would give a reference. They would say Quran 424 says that. Mm -hmm. So that's just quite amazing. And 10 years ago, no one would have known any of this. Yeah, the times are changing. The apostate prophet has been uh, cracking me up with uh, with all of the tons of super chats he's been sending. And I'm thinking, I keep it's, I keep forgetting because I'm like, where's he getting all this money from? <laughs> and then I'm like, oh, <laughs> Muhammad Hijab. <laughs> so, so AP has all these uh, more than 100 new patrons. And so he's he's probably going to just spend this month uh, going around. I, and I'm thinking that because uh, that's what I've been planning, too. I've been planning on... Uh, uh, getting video of me just dropping super chats on everyone's channel with, you know, hey, this is from Muhammad Hijab. This is from Muhammad Hijab. <laughs> um, salt, salt, Dogit. Um, and I'm bringing this up because there were several comments that were similar to the, several questions that were similar to this. Harris, what was the final straw that made you realize Islam was false? So there are several uh, questions along these lines of kind of what was the what was the, the biggest thing? Because leaving Islam is usually a, a kind of process. And so. What was the what was the straw that you know i the... actually thought about it afterwards when i had left when i realized i am an atheist you know it's like i, I didn't most people i've spoken with they they can't put a date to it mm -hmm. um so i can't put a date to it either there was all these things happening simultaneously my friend Vidu, the the one i just spoke about the one who who doubted after charlie hebdo that guy actually has a date written down. He said, that is the day when I became an ex-Muslim. Um, and that thing had happened uh, about the Charlie Hebdo thing had happened. And I think that was one of the biggest things that happened. And somebody told him, hey, bro, you're talking like Richard Dawkins. You're an atheist. And then he said, maybe I am an atheist. Yes, I am an atheist. That's, what, that's how he realized. I can't put a date to it. When I wrote my book afterwards, and I rewinded as far as back as far back as I could go, and as I said, that, that was one of the few crucial points in my life. When I read accidentally read that article where this guy was 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 critiquing Richard Dawkins, and then that started a journey. And then I'm looking into all these other arguments every day. I'm consuming that, um, and I'm reading those books. But to me, I think the biggest problem. So when I wrote my book down, I, I pointed out three things. First of all, there's no evidence for any God. There's just no evidence. If we just talk about scientifically and philosophically, uh, there's no empirical evidence or even, in my opinion, no rational, no rational argument for any God either. But OK, if we ignore that uh, aside, the second part, the moral lessons that we get from Islam are horrible. That that no sane person can say, oh, there is some morality in that. I mean, uh, the creator of billions of galaxies could not have said, you know, um, just go to the neighboring village and kill their men and take their women as sex slaves. Um, uh, or, you know, that 
owning sex slaves themselves that was that that has resonated with me for a very long period of time because you know i'm a man it should not hurt me as much as it should appeal to some females because you can just imagine but then obviously as men we, we also have a different view of looking at it imagine someone come i give this hypothetical to all the new muslims who come to my show and and and, and they challenge they challenge me i said just imagine indian forces come to your village they kill all you all of your men and take your wives as slaves and they can do whatever they want with them how would you feel that's literally exactly what quran in, in allows you the, the quran allows that there's no no way no two ways about it and people yeah. like shabir ali made that video there's no and, denying in that by, so, by the way yeah. by the way that was uh that's that was the first thing i recall bothered nabil um was going through uh what sahih al-bukhari sahih muslim and sunan abu Dawood said about the historical background of Surah 4, verse 24. Um, you know, we, we talked about Aisha, Muhammad and Aisha and stuff. He didn't really have a, a terrible problem with that. He justified it. And uh, but as, he didn't tell me he didn't tell me until later. He didn't tell me until after he became a Muslim um, that, hey, you know, when I was kind of given weak responses to that 424 stuff, he said, it was tearing me up. It was tearing me up inside. I was I was just thinking, you know, hey, what if my mother and my sister who are, you know, from a uh, you know what's considered a heretical sect of Islam. What if they conquer? What 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 would they what would they do? And if they weren't Muslims, when, then what would they be allowed to do? To exactly yeah. So yeah, that that that's one one thing that's bothered me. But I wouldn't say that's all of it. Uh, what was caused me? Because uh, obviously I, I learned Islam a lot of it after I had I was watching Dawkins and I was reading these books. The, the sex slavery. For example, sun and the moon have an orbit. And then the third point, point well, first was no evidence for God, second moral argument, and then the, and the scientific blunders in the Quran. I mean, sun and the moon have an orbit. There are 11 verses that say that. Day and night and sun and moon have an orbit. I mean, and these people, when I, when I, when I look, when I, when I try to find the counter arguments or justifications of that, all I saw was these red herrings that people just making things up in incredible amount of mental gymnastics. And I say that if mental gymnastics was a sport uh, in Olympics, Muslims would have won gold medals mm. every time. It's, it, 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 the, the amount, and, and I said, why, why do you have to do this? It's a lot simpler to say, yeah, maybe it is nonsense. Maybe, mm. maybe somebody did make it up. 1400 years ago uh, the, the scientific mistakes are hilarious uh, but the, i've written all of that in my book in detail i think that's one of the biggest chapter and the other chap my other chapter about morality point uh, there's an argument of morality but it's specific to islam i only discuss the life of my character of muhammad because um, you know he is the best guide for muslims to follow he is and just I, I've, I've just listed the number of women he had in his lives and that alone should should just make everyone's skin crawl that mm. how could you the story of Safiya, Rehana and Zainab but the, the, there's just far too many or uh, or not yeah. even not even the number of women he would have in his life the number of women he would sometimes have in one night it's pretty uh... <laughs> yeah that's one hadith. yeah that's one hadith. I mean it says yeah it's um, it's embarrassing and he had the strength of what 40 men or something yeah <laughs> sexual strength <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, Viagra before Viagra was cool, huh? <laughs> yeah, it was. It, it, it is amazing because that that's also in their in their view of heaven. Like, what are we going to do with all these horries? And you have these these passages about Allah blessing them with eternal erections, miraculous erections, so that their penises <laughs> never go never go limp. And it's like, wait a minute. So Muhammad is like a kind of an example of what to look forward to in his his uh, his uh, supercharged miraculous sex drive, and so. Yeah, with, with the, on the on the issue of, of scientific miracles, that in in my mind it, it's parallel to, it's parallel to, the issue of like perfect preservation. If all along you had been saying that you know Allah is giving revelations according to the understanding of the people at the time, and this isn't meant to be a scientific textbook or something like that, that would be one thing. But when you build the confidence in your religion upon perfect preservation, right down to the dot, right down to the letter, and miraculous scientific perfect insights that you know are only being verified today you they keep setting the bar so high that i mean five minutes of research just just brings everything crashing crashing that argument ground. is so weak that yeah. argument is so weak it doesn't work first of all if they say that it was, god was only speaking with the with, with the desert dwellers at the time 
um, then the point is, why is he talking about it in the first place? And the second point is, it means that the book is not eternal and for all times and all people. So mm-hmm. it was only for those the group of people. Um, and uh, yeah, and as I said, why was he talking about it at all that he created Earth and Heaven in six days? Oh, no, it wasn't six days as in our days. <laughs> okay, then what days is he talking about? Is he talking about Martian days or is he talking about J- J- Jupiter, Juno days? Or what is he talking about? Why would he be talking about some other days? So it just doesn't work and it becomes very clear to any person, even if he's a believer at that time, it's very easy to shake their faith just a little bit. And you're right. Mm-hmm. When you shake them a little bit, some people, some hurt, <laughs> butthurt people come to my comment and they say, you know, Harris, after watching your videos, my iman, my faith has has strengthened tenfold. I'm like, yeah, all right. <laughs> you're just saying that because you're yeah. trying to reassert that yeah. your faith is intact. You're trying to reassert that. You're telling yourself, no, 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 I still have faith, but you don't. Yeah, that's what that's what I was mentioning earlier about this uh, sort of compensating um, this, this, all right, I didn't know this before and this is bothering me, therefore let me, uh, let me compensate by, ah, you've made me a much stronger, made me a much stronger Muslim. <laughs> um, here's a related... Uh, wasn't going to post this one, but since you were talking about this, um, I guess to get your your views, uh, we are getting questions like this. Techno guy, well, oh no, actually he, he directed this towards me, I think. Um, but how will you, but since you're here, how will you deal with a Muslim who says sex slavery and pedophilia is perfectly moral? And maybe the reason for this is we just had a Muslim on with us, um, Dr. Shuaib Syed, who's, uh, I think he's like cousins or something with Zakir Naik, but he's a popular Muslim apologist um, in India. But he said, uh, we were going through the issue of, you know, sex captives and um, temporary marriage, muta and so on. And he was just saying, so we would say, look, that's prostitution. That's prostitution. You're hiring a, you're hiring a woman, you're giving her money and you're, you're, you're sleeping with her. That's prostitution. He would just say, if Allah says it's okay, then it's okay. It's not even prostitution. Wait a minute. You're giving her money for sex. You're giving her money for sex. That's prostitution. He would say it's not. It's not prostitution. It's uh, it because Allah says it's okay. But every, you know, in every instance, it would be, well, if Allah allows that, then it's it's just not immoral. So if you had a Muslim, uh, it, let's say Ali Dawa. If Ali Dawa was saying, hey, if a nine-year-old girl. Now, I don't believe Aisha had reached puberty, uh, according to the Muslim sources, but even going with their view, if someone said, hey, you know, having sex, a 50-some-year-old man having sex with a nine-year-old girl is not immoral because Allah says it's fine, what, how would you respond there? You know, um, most of them actually, those, those who, are, who do become aware of uh, sex slavery, they do defend it. So all these scholars defend it. So let's get it. So what they do is they obviously go through these mental gymnastics and they tell you, oh, you know, what were we meant to do with these women? Their husbands had been killed in the war. Um, I'm like, okay, maybe give them a house and shelter, but why are you, you know, taking your own advantage out of it? And then I say, you know, so the, the, the easiest thing I tell them, so by according to your worldview, that's perfectly fine, especially when I'm engaging with Pakistanis and all that, because they're making these excuses. I say, okay, so, so when the United States went to Afghanistan, just imagine when they're killing Taliban, they're taking their women as the slaves. Would you be okay with that? I think when we when we when we put that in, because on the other hand, they're just telling America, oh, the evil country. I, I one of the videos actually did go viral. I spoke with this guy who was saying 9/11 was an inside job or whatever. I don't know if you've seen that video, but but that is a typical Pakistani mind. Um, and so, you know, I, I was acting like a yank there, yeah. <laughs> like, oh, America is great. But, but anyway, so when you actually put that into perspective that, OK, so these white Americans, these evil infidels, when they come to your country, because, you know, now there's a war. Forget about who's just and who's just, who's not just because everyone other side always thinks that the other side is unjust. So now they're taking the killing Taliban and they're taking the women. How, do you, how would you feel when when you speak with that? People do. People do respond to that. They, I, I have never heard of a decent comeback from anyone else. With with more seasoned mental gymnasts, like uh, the actual scholars, they would make all types of excuses. You leave them as they are. They know that's the worldview. I'll tell you a funny thing. If someone is so rigid in their stance, I, I, I had a friend 
still is kind of a friend. Sunni Muslim, you know, Shias don't have the problem, as you said, mutas, they can do the muta. Uh, Sunnis have the problem. They're like, so one day this friend of mine comes to me and he says, Harris, he's married. Harris, if I, um, how do I, if I go to a brothel and hire a prostitute and just tell her verbally at the, at the start, because I'm paying her, she would be like, yeah, sure. If I just tell her at the start that you are my captive, you are my right hand possessed. <laughs> so, so if I do that, and then, you know, I do my business, half an hour, whatever I booked her for, however long I booked her for, I do my business, and then I move out. Well, that would be halal, I think, Harris. What do you reckon? <laughs> and I said, you know well, what? It kind of is halal mm-hmm. because, yes, you said it that you would, you're right hand possessed. And because you're paying us, you would say, yeah, sure, man, whatever. All right. It, it, it's halal. So what is the difference? And you're right. All these things. And, and there's so many hadiths after hadith after hadith that, that show us that these women were treated like objects, like sex slave. All right. Right hand possessed. Now I've, I've had you for one year, six months or however long I wanted. And then I've sold you to someone else. I think the only fic is that if she gives birth, then you can't sell her just by herself. I think that that's the only thing. But there's no there's there's no dilemma about selling them, treating them. So that is kind of a prostitution as well, in in a sense. Um, so I think I think the only thing we can do is just build a human connection. Just tell them that if United States does that, kill the kill the bad guy, take the women. But on the other hand, what what, what America does is like you know try to rehabilitate, try to build infrastructure there. That's the level how far humanity has gone. But the book that they're dealing with 1400 years ago, that's a simple solution. Take their women and, uh, and you know, you use them for your own sexual pleasure. And not only just that, they actually say we're actually doing women the service. Those women who are now widowed, whose husbands you've just killed, what are they going to do? Yep, I've seen that. Of course, they would also crave a man. So... We're just giving them uh, some sexual services. I mean, that's the level of these people. And um, I, 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 you just have to believe in humanity at, at those levels. And you just have to think that maybe you give these analogies, draw this metaphor, draw, draw the real life comparison. It, if it appeals to them, fair enough. If it doesn't, then let them be. I, I reckon it does. I reckon it works on them at some point. Yeah, so... Um... So I guess it would just be. So I guess your your approach here would just be to keep bringing up more and more issues until one of them sticks, right? Where someone where they go, no, that, oh right, yeah, that is wrong. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Here's an interesting one from uh, Vince Clortho, and we'll probably it's getting late, so we'll just take another one or two. But uh, Vince Clortho uh, says, Act Seventeen Apologetics and Harris, uh, what would be your estimate for when apostasy will be effectively legally recognized and generally accepted across the nominally Islamic world? Well, I reckon apostasy will be generally accepted a lot sooner than it will be legally changed. Now, the one success story just, I think, a couple of months ago, Sudan um, uh, abolished uh, uh, the law against apostasy. Uh, in Sudan, South Sudan, it was, or I don't know, oh, no, maybe Somalia. Well, anyway, Sudan, I, th- I think it was Sudan. I think it was Sudan. Um, so, so out of 12 countries, now it's let down, we're down to 11 countries where um, apostasy is punishable by death, and the 12th country being my country, Pakistan, which is blasphemy. So, I reckon legally, governments are too scared. Legally, they're not going to do it. These kind of laws are, are triggered by movements, by by people, and at, on surface, as you said, Islam looks like this big gorilla at this point that I'm strong, and you know this, un, you can't shake it. But we're just eating it from inside. Now, Iran officially hijab, even something like hijab, is compulsory, and uh, you have to wear a hijab. But we're looking at 50% of the people have left Islam, so you have Islamic r- ritual, is Islamic laws in a country which is not even dominated by Islam. 30, according to the same study, only 32% are Shias. Iran is supposed to be the only Shia country in the world, and the population is only 32%. So, so all the laws are still in place because the regime, the Islamic revolution that came, and the regime that is in place, that is built around that. So 
it has to be it has to come from people so i think apostasy will become normalized amongst people before uh the the laws getting abolished and then you know something like iran i mean it, it would either change or it would just be overthrown i would say that would happen in iran i mean the, the, i keep i'm sorry i keep saying that i'm very happy about it but uh, if something like this happens in pakistan for instance in the next 10 years that would be massive i would say just just ho- just hold on to your seats just get your popcorn grab your pop- popcorns because um within 10 years we're going to see some really amazing interesting things and apostasy will be normal not only just that and when when you when you are becoming apostate then islam is dying on its own um yeah my answer is uh 5 years mm. 10 conservative I'll still give it 10 10 conservatively <laughs> Um, yeah, and not ne- not necessarily for every country, but for some of the major ones. I think, uh, yeah, everyone, you can if 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 we hit the year twenty thirty, and we haven't seen we haven't seen uh, apostasy legally recognized in let's say most most of these countries where there are still laws against it. You can contact me and say, David, you were wrong. Shame on you. You are you are not, failing. You are not the super. You are, you are not the super planner that we thought you were. Yeah. Nah, yeah. Look, I I agree. Well, look, within five years, we'll see some amazing results. But for them, a government to be forced into changing laws, etc., that might. Take, I don't know. <laughs> you know, I'm not a Muhammad. I'm not a Muhammad, so I can't tell about the future. <laughs> yeah, I'm, ju- I'm. I'm. I'm just thinking. I'm just th- the, all the stuff that we're talking about, about uh, you know the holes in the narrative coming out, and it's really all this stuff coming out, and then uh, the response from you know the community is to become angrier and more aggressive, and you know, so this is, but this is this is. You can't keep that up forever, right? That's going to cause more people like, you know, you're talking about Vidu Viz looking at this going, wait, what are, what are we freaking out over all this stuff and so on? And then it's going to mm. make them have doubts. So I think everything's just going to snowball and avalanche really, really quick, like, especially if, uh, you know, if we keep pushing, if we if we keep pushing as hard as as hard as we are. And so to everyone who's saying, David, why aren't you focusing more on Christianity? This is this is the re- and we're trying I'm trying to You're doing God's you know, work. Yeah, I want everyone united on breaking those power structures that keep people uh intellectually oppressed so that they can't even think about any of this stuff or they can't even have an honest conversation about it without being accused of of blasphemy and so on. Guys, there are tons of preachers in the world. I'm one of them, but there aren't a lot of people focusing on this. You know, there there just aren't enough people when you think about dangerous ideologies this is something that a lot of people need to focus on. And whether you're Hindu, I, Hindu, atheist, yeah. agnostic, Christian, Jew, I mean, just think about all those different groups and the impact that Islam is having on them. My goodness. Um, yeah, so if, if, if... I have a question for you. Sure. I have a question for you. I mean, obviously you did that 12, 13 years ago. You started at roughly the same time when Mariam Namazi showed up. Um uh, maybe she might have showed up a little bit earlier, but you and everyone, this ex-Muslim, at that time, obviously, you would not have known this term ex-Muslim. But since you're in your journey, you've seen some amazing success stories and amazing, this whole movement just basically grown in front of your eyes. Mm-hmm. And obviously, your journey is a lot longer. So you've been mm-hmm. doing it for 13 years. And now we're just predicting 10 more years or five to 10 more years. So this will be a whole career of 20 years or something. And how do you see it that this must be very satisfying for you as well? I mean, people like me, I started in 2017. AP started maybe mm-hmm. around the same time. I think I started in 2018. AP started 2017 and Dulla Samir and all these other guys are just showing up. There's, there, there's five Urdu speaking YouTubers now, three of them from within Pakistan doing these kind of work. How does that feel? I mean, you... Being and, and you're not even being from a Muslim background, you mm-hmm. know? Yeah. No, it's uh, it, you can actually go back. Um, I could find, I could find one or two videos very early on, where I would say my focus is not on getting Muslims to leave Islam. My focus is on keeping people from converting to Islam. Um, and the the reason was, 
I mean, I just spent, I just spent four years talking to one guy, right? Talking to one guy to get him to yeah. leave, to get him to you know convince him to leave Islam. And I'm just thinking that is man. If that's if that's how, if, yeah, if that's how hard it is, got got to be much easier to keep someone from converting than you know getting someone to leave Islam after they're already you know already dug in. So I was focusing on that. But yeah, back then there were ex-Muslims, but man, they were rare as far as ex-Muslims that you'd ever hear from. People who were ex-Muslims in public, they were rare, right? It was Nabil and a, and a couple others that I would even be uh, would have even been familiar with. Whereas now they're just everywhere. They're everywhere. They have the tons of channels, tons of websites. They're all over Twitter, all over Facebook. And so if things changed that rapidly, you know, in, in 13, 14, 15 years, you know, what, what, what happens five years from now, 10 years from now? And so, yeah, it's awesome. It's awesome to, it's awesome to see this. And, and back, you know, in 2010, when I decide, hey, I'm going to focus, I'm going to focus a lot of energy on YouTube. There was almost no one doing this uh, a lot. I mean, a lot of Christians thought me, thought of me as kind of untouchable because as we were talking about earlier, you get associated with, you know, oh, you're a right wing extremist or, uh, you know, it's yeah. you're opposing Islam because you must be a white nationalist or something like that. There's that. And hey, why are you blasting away at this ideology here? And so no one wanted to touch this stuff. And so it was kind of a situation where I'm too much of a jerk towards Islam for Christians to want to have much, much to do with me. I'm too Christian for atheists to want to have much to do with me. Um, and so it's just, I'm kind of out of no man's land and it's just me going, nope, I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep blasting away. I'm going to keep blasting away because I believe, I believe this is going to be successful in the long run. And so, yeah, looking back and saying, you know, hearing from all the people um, who've, uh, you know, j just from my channel, but not only from, from, you know, from my channel, just from, the the whole the whole project because after that you know other people started springing up and so on and now there's this giant thing and it's it's only going to keep snowballing and uh i'm sure you've seen the clips of people like Bilal phillips just warning the community about this avalanche of apostasy they they're in they're the muslim leaders they're in trouble right now because they recognize what's coming they've got all these people coming to them with their doubts and you've got people like yasser Qadi and shabir ali and they saw, hey, we've, you know, the religion's been propped up on these lies, so we kind of need to ease Muslims into the idea that there are differences in these manuscripts. We kind of have to let that out there because we can't we can't keep building it on, you know, building it on lies. And so they kind of both kind of ease it in there. And there's this huge backlash against them. How dare you? You you're you're causing doubt and so on. And so the Muslim community largely responds, no, we've got our myth. And you don't get to you don't get to to shatter our myth. But guys, the comments are already out there. They've already admitted it. They've already admitted it. And so, just looking and then you know and then looking at you know hijab and Ali Dawa and these guys freaking out left and right. And I'm just looking back, going, "Wow, it's finally it's finally uh, it's finally happening." So, yeah. And awesome. these are just the guys who are. And these are just the guys who are actually in front of you, like Hijab and Ali Dawa. But uh, someone, there was an Eid festival, not this uh, animal slaughtering one, but the one before, two months prior to that. There was an Eid festival, um, obviously, in the Muslim world. And um, one, of, one, of, one of the guys actually recorded a video. He said, Harris, I've never, ever heard these guys crap on atheists ever before, these, these local clerics. He said he'd never heard of him. And now uh, there's another guy just out of nowhere as well, sent me a similar comment as well. And one of the guy actually recorded it. And he said, these guys are now actually crapping on. They used to go on about uh, attacking Hinduism or Christianity. But now they're like, whoa, these atheists, Islam is people are leaving Islam in huge numbers because these atheists are just attacking our religion with no holes barred kind of a match. And um, you're right. I mean, the, Bilal is, is just one example, but there are so many others who have recognized that this apostasy, forget about going to Christianity or atheists or not. It's just the apostasy. It's, the, mm -hmm. it's your own house. It's crumbling right before your eyes. You're looking at it and it's like the building is just coming down and you can't do anything. You, just, you go you go close to it. You might get buried in, in it yourself. So. Mm -hmm. Um, definitely very interesting times, but and you you obviously 
you know, as you were saying earlier, that when people look back and they're, they're like, oh, yeah, these were the people who did that, you would be right up there at the top because um, despite the fact, you know, one thing that I, I, I really hope that you would have achieved in that one as well, obviously you achieved in turning a lot, a lot of, waking up a lot of Muslims. Um, there's so many ex-Muslims that tell me, oh, David would change me. But the other thing that I hope that you have had some sort of success is that these white Christian women white women who convert to Islam. Islam has a big fetish, as you know, in mm -hmm. converting people, yeah. and uh, especially the women. Women, why not the women? So um, I, and I've, had, I've had so many women uh, contact me and they say, yeah, and most of the time it's because they convert to Islam because they're in love with some dude. Yep. And, and, and then he says, oh, yeah, you got to convert to Islam. And, and then they leave, and then they leave them, and then they're like, and then these women are like, oh, okay. At that time, those women struggle. Now that chapter is closed, should they move on, go back to the original line? But, but people te generally don't like to go back. We just, life is actually moving forward. Mm -hmm. So some of the women actually stay in Islam, even though the reason why they had become Muslim is gone. But then we, have, we are also seeing a surge of these women who are actually becoming white ex-Muslims. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, you know, some, some of these ex-Muslim women who just say, I'm an ex-Muslim dude, and some people are just, some Muslims are not even taking them seriously. That's how bitter mm -hmm. they are. They say, oh, you were never even a Muslim to begin with. Mm -hmm. You were a Christian, and then you converted to Islam. Yeah. But I think the, the challenge that we have, I've been speaking with one of my patrons, and um, actually, no, he told me not to talk about this, but, um, but, but there's so many stories where people, uh, what, we, what we, I hope you have some sort of success in actually preventing women to um, to actually going towards Islam because I do get a lot of messages now from white women and I'm, my, my you say this about Islam but my boyfriend is saying this about Islam <laughs> and then I say well go and ask him this go and ask him this what it says here and um, but because at that time the, the you know they're in love they want to get married they just don't listen to me but then there was one Australian woman who did that and then three uh, uh, two years later she just contacted me and I told her I said don't do it. She, this guy was Pakistani, and he, she was saying, I'm going to Pakistan, live with him happily ever after. Over there. I said, don't do it. Don't, don't do it. So, but, but she's like, she, she just, I think she, she never responded to me. And then just last month, I remember she messaged me, and she said that she came back to Australia, and it didn't work out. And, mm -hmm. But then she was still defending Islam, but she was saying, I'm still a Muslim. But that's just a journey. But I hope you get those messages too from women about that and what are you doing about preventing it since given that you said that was your original goal mm -hmm. to stop people from converting to islam no i hear uh, i hear tons i hear tons of messages that are along those lines as well i usually don't uh post those but you know sometimes i'll uh make compilation videos just reading out comments from people who've left islam um yeah like i said i usually don't post the messages from people who said hey you know i was about to convert to islam and then you know then I saw this from your from your videos, but uh, yeah, it's it's kind of a it's kind of a mixed it's kind of a mixed group because you get messages from people saying yeah I was about to convert to Islam and thank you for you know what I learned from your your videos, but also from people who don't listen, and then I hear from them later. Uh, one was me and me and Sam Shimon actually sat down with uh, a young woman and a Muslim who was actually getting her to become his second wife so she she had converted based on all this uh oh, wow. all the on all this information and she was converting she had, well she had already converted to islam but now she was going to be his second wife so not legally recognized in the united states but there'd be an islamic ceremony and so she actually didn't listen to us she became his second wife um and then yeah it was it was several years later um hey you're right <laughs> i told you so <laughs> yeah, I'm a, yeah I'm a, uh, well now that, that was actually a cool situation because um yeah there, there was never any legal legally binding ceremony so uh they had their islamic divorce and she had custody of the kid and she's she's a, a christian now but yeah those are the situations like it's like guys why are you jumping into this if we're right if we're right you're going to be in a lot of pain so you might want to think about you might want to think about this before you before you uh jump into this also uh, me and the apostate prophet we've talked we've we've talked about this recently where um we actually want to make we want to make videos along the lines of before you convert to islam watch this 
and it's basically you know good rundown of hey if you're converting if you're if you're about to convert to islam watch this specifically because specifically for something that you know if your friends about to convert to islam or your family members about to convert to islam you're, you're going to be looking uh oh what do i uh, what, what, what you're going to be scrambling at the last second uh, gosh he's about to he's about to go and convert what do i do and so we kind of want to have videos that hey, just sit down with your friend watch this video uh, possibly you know he's free to convert if he wants to convert but Try and try and uh, try and sit down with them and go through this stuff. And it's going to be, hey, if you're about to convert, you've probably been told this, 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 and this. Let's take a quick look at this. You know, hey, it's a big decision. At least you could do is spend ten minutes going through this and uh, go through the evidence. But uh, yep, you, you know, there's a you, you you know there's a TV show is called Banged Up Abroad. Uh, I don't know what what it's called in America. There's an American version too. I think Locked Up Abroad is something. So where these people go and they may they get a pro they're on a holiday they're down um, the, the cars are down they're poor and they're going through depression or whatnot and then someone approaches and say hey do you want 10 grand just make a trip to this uh, south american c country and then come back to whatever and then you know i'll give you 10 grand you're like why are you doing this just for 10 grand <laughs> you know and and um and then you know these people go there and then they get arrested and then they spend 10 years in prison and then mm -hmm. the whole show is about their journey inside the cell same like that with these people they're the two types of converts the first is obviously you know some dude who's just had a very nice friend and he's just he's angry he's just going through some other life problems and he's, he blames the west and he blames christianity if he's that's his background and he says okay i'm gonna find a new life you know you you white folks do you you got you guys do this kind of thing you know you guys you went into kabbalah and then you go into yogism and you know all, all that kind of crap um but so so then they go okay islam became fashion you know mike tyson and you know all these guys that become okay so and then um uh the other type is the other type is women who fall in love Mm -hmm. um with those are the ones that are in the hardest one now you gave one example i have one example of the australian white woman as well and i was like yeah no, but, she, but he was just she i think her mind was saying listen to this guy what he's saying mm -hmm. i even told her i said this is like mafia like the locked up abroad merger you're going in and there's no way out mm -hmm. A apostasy is punishable by death how, how, why would anyone go in that kind of that's like joining the mafia you know they say that in mafia movies like oh there's plenty of doors to come in but no way to out no way out um but at that time they're in love mm -hmm. that time they kind of but these other people i think those people who go through these some sort of circumstances problems and whatnot they are probably more likely to 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 listen to uh or watch those videos by the way muslim scholars are right ahead uh, ahead of you on that I, I was watching this on one of the biggest pakistani cable channels there was this cleric was sitting on tv and he was saying yeah you know we have to change our ways a part native apostates should be killed for death mm. for, uh, but if someone converts then we shouldn't kill them because again he had his own st uh, st um, strategy in that too he was saying because these people these islamophobes are telling white people that if you go in you'll be ki you won't be able to leave so therefore we should make an amendment that if a white person converts to islam they can leave islam but natives native apostles yeah yeah well they got it they got to be <laughs> sounds like uh, sounds like innovation <laughs> same, <laughs> innovation that same, is being forced by people like you yeah same thing with the uh, same thing with muhammad hijab you can't just say oh allah says this but let me uh, make it uh, more palatable for for a modern generation exile. give them yeah. the option of exile yeah um no i i've i've heard i've heard uh tons of stories and yes tried talking to the women who are in love <laughs> very 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 <laughs> difficult difficult, v difficult yeah. to talk to and what what's sad is you know you know the entire time that it's going to be much more difficult for her because she's going to marry this guy and by the time she starts to by the time her hormones start to settle and she's actually able to look into this she actually finds out Islam is false. Well, now you're married and you're in Pakistan and you've got three kids. And it's a much more difficult, much more difficult path to get out of Islam mm. then than if you just if you just said, you know, this is a pretty big life decision. I need to make sure that this is uh, this is correct here. 
Yeah. Yep. Um, we have a question here. Uh, yeah, we should be wrapping up. Oh, let's see. Yeah, six. Yeah, we'll be wrapped up in the next six minutes. Uh, Afif Kaja says, um, David, you are doing a great job, but I don't think it is fruitful to spend any time with personal squabble, such as with hijab and dawah. We should focus on Islam. Um, Afif, and, and uh, I'd be interested in uh, Harris's response. Uh, Afif, I know we want to say, and we just want to focus on uh, responding to Islamic arguments and so on. Yeah, I would say you have to realize there are people who have massive influence, right, in the Muslim community, and they're going around thumping their chests. And uh, it's, it's very common to think, let's just focus on making sure we have the best arguments here. And if we have the best arguments, we win. Well, not if, not if this other guy has built up such a, a massive, uh, this other guy builds up such a massive crowd, such a mob, that they can just come and kill you. Right, so I'm not I'm not talking about hijab here. I'm talking about the principle in general. Right? Yeah. When you when you focus when you focus you don't focus on a growing movement, and you focus on hey let me just make sure I have the best arguments. Well, if a giant mob that will gladly kill you is forming, then guess what? That they win. They win. They they defeat they defeat your great brilliant argument. Right. So you have to be a, you have to pay attention to both. You have to pay attention to having uh, good, correct, strong, powerful arguments. You also have to pay attention to when people are taking things in another direction. As far as his job is concerned, the moment he said, I'm going after women. All right. Then I'm going I'm going after uh, I'm going after you. And so I'll be going yeah. after I'll be going after his job until he takes down his tweets and apologizes after that. Hey, he can do what he wants. I hope you, I hope the best for him. You know, it's so funny. Uh, well, I, I know Afif, uh, Afif's point. Actually, he, he's, uh, I, I know he's a very nice uh, ex-Muslim. He's an American ex-Muslim, I think. Um, I, I see his point. But the problem is, as you said, David, everything, when you're in public domain, everything has some sort of an impact. It might look personal to you, but the 200,000 people who follow hijab and there's 500,000 people that follow David Wood, they're watching it. The learning and then, you know, people pick up these cues. You know, the first thing that I noticed when, when you went after the Quran, you could have started going after Muhammad Hijab's wife. You could have started going cracking jokes about Hijab's wife or Hijab's children. I don't know if he has any or not. You could, the, the, you know, I mean, you, you've got far bigger reach than I do. People send me, people send me memes that make memes of my people, you know, who criticize me that they, they, they make derogatory memes about them and then. People say, and, and I'm like, yeah, I can't do that. So, you know, there's so much. But, so smarter people, Afif, you notice that, that actually a lot more can be done. But what is happening here? So so, so David is actually going after hijab, and there's a, there's, there, it's not madness. There's a full-on method behind this. This is a strategy. This is, this is, this is encirclement of a, of, a, of a dying army that Muslims are hating hijab for actually doing this. You know, they don't care. They don't care what's, what's involved. You're abusing a pastor's wife or you're uh, abusing David Wood or his wife or not. They don't care about that. But what they do care about is that the Quran is being desecrated because of hijab. Who is going to back? We've already seen hijabs backing down a little bit, but then mm -hmm. he comes back again because his ego is too big. Mm -hmm. And it's only it's only a matter of time. And let me make a prediction better than Prophet Muhammad's prediction. Muhammad hijab will back down. He's going to back, he oh, back down. I, I guarantee he's going to back down. And I know he's watching this. And I know that's crushing his pride to think, well, I can't back down now because David Wood said I'm going to back down. Hijab, you're going to back down. Could be now. Could be after a lot more pain. But you're going to back down. There was a sign, as I said, when he made that tweet about, oh, after two days after he said Abu Bakr did this, it's okay to go after the wives. He's saying Islam has got nothing to do with it. And then he's apologizing and he says that I will adhere to the terms and conditions of sapience or whatever this whole institute is. Obviously, someone has told him, hey, bro, if you ever do something like this again, we're not. So he's under the pump. And now if he's a if he's a representative and and I and I know that these Muslim apologetic groups, they think that hijab has a lot to offer. He's obviously smart. He can speak fluently. He's he's good with that. So he, he they, they see something in him. But obviously his anger issues, his emotional discharges, these things are getting him in trouble. And mo his own crowd is turning against him. That, dude, this white Islamophobe is desecrating our 
holy book because of you. Just please don't do it. And you're right. People do think about, okay, let's find a solution. And um, it, it, it's not personal. I mean, it, there's nothing there's nothing to lose for you. So, I mean, mm. I, I don't think this is sensible for you. I mean, I personally haven't desecrated the Quran myself because I want to be able to engage with Pakistani mm. clerics. I, I want to be able to speak, reach out to masses of Pakistani population, they, they, which I know otherwise they would just not be interested in engaging in me. Um, uh, you know, like, for example, Mufti Abu Layth I speak with. I've had a conversation with him, but but you know these personal differences are even actually good for the movement because they propel you into arguments and they, they propel you forward. With Mufti Abu Layth, I don't even feel like disagreeing with him. I'm like, yeah, all right, we don't even argue. I mean, sometimes mm-hmm. I send him messages about certain things. Um, and what's your opinion and this and that, and then I just get his view, but I don't argue with him. Mm-hmm. The, the, there are some other people that I've spoken with, um, I don't even feel like arguing with them anymore. But but they see the importance of my work. I'm not mm-hmm. going to put words in their mouth, but but they see that that what we're doing, and then like any reaction, you put out something, half the people are going to believe in it, the other half are not going to believe in it. But that's the level playing field we're creating, and those kind of personal squabbles, I think they're useful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I agree completely. And... <laughs> Guys, I, I don't. But most 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 people are are cheering it on, right? They want it. They want to see it. They want to see someone who's really. It's entertainment. Yeah, it is. It's it's a uh, you know it's and and I saw I saw it I saw it instantly. I even mentioned it in a video. If you have a if you have a proud man, if you have a proud man here, you defeat this yeah, you defeat this proud man by pitting him against something that he loves. Himself. Where he ha- he he has to you wait for him to put himself in a position where you can make him have to choose. I have to choose this, which will crush my pride, or I have to choose my pride, which will result in bad things for this. And then you, you see what happens. Hey, Muhammad Hijab, you're going to desecrate your Quran unless you back down. So it's it's my pride or my religion. What's more important? So far, it's been uh, it's been his pride. But yeah, it is. I don't know. I think it's and people see that, mm-hmm. and people see that other Muslims are seeing that he's putting his pride, which means he doesn't care about the Quran. Mm-hmm. He doesn't care about the honor of the prophet. He doesn't care about the sentiments of Muslims. He doesn't care about that. He's trying to use that. Okay, I will use that. That, oh, look, Islamophobes. But no, man, it's not that simple. It doesn't work that way. People are seeing that you're being provoked by him. And he's the one. He he can save countless lives of the Qurans (laughs) by simply taking down his tweets. But he wouldn't because, as you said, his pride is bigger than him. Yeah, and it's uh, the situation is. I mean, it's interesting because I mean that that's a command, right? Surah six, verse one hundred eight. Hey, if they're going, if they're going to heap abuse on your on your religion, on your God, you stop the insulting. It would, you know, it would be different if we said, "Hey, I'm going to desecrate the Quran unless you stop praying." Well, there, you know, there you, you can't, you know, you're not going to stop praying. It's the idea is something that's non-essential. It's non-essential. You don't have to be insulting uh, these mm. other people. But so if you're doing something non-essential and that non-essential thing is going to cause people to heap abuse on Allah or on your religion, you stop what you're doing. And so the Quran actually gives us an ability to order people to do something. But I mean, notice that the early Muslims were, and including Muhammad, were in this exact same position. They were insulting the uh, gods and goddesses and the idols of the pagans. They repeatedly tried to get Muhammad to stop. Muhammad wouldn't stop. They tried to negotiate. That didn't work. Finally, it got to the point where they said, you stop or we're going to insult Allah. And then, uh uh-oh, what do we do? Do we back down from these guys? Do we back down from them? Do we start obeying them because they're threatening to insult Allah? And Allah says, yes, you do. You back down right now. You stop insulting that. You do what they're telling you to do because that's how important your religion, the honor of Allah is supposed to be to you. That's how important it is. Back down. Don't care if it hurts your pride. And it's just amazing. You've got Muhammad Ajab reading the same Quran and saying, yes, Muhammad himself backed down, from, backed down from insulting these guys when they, he was being ordered. He Muhammad was Muhammad himself was humble enough to say, I'm choosing my religion over my pride. And yet hijab is just greater. <laughs> He's greater. There's a sahih there's a sahih hadith as well that Muhammad said that do not do not curse the gods of others so they uh, so they do not curse your gods. Yeah. 
uh, there's a Sahi Hadid as well. So, yeah, I mean, um, hijab, pe- people see that. People see that. And, and, and that's, again, it's working for you, not for hijab. You you don't have to, you know the worst thing you know the helplessness that they have hmm. hijab as arrogant as as a malevolent bully he is he he inside he's like man I wish I could burn the Bible and even if he could you know it wouldn't hurt you but again we know humans react that way um, you know especially people like uh, hijab himself They're like okay I'm gonna get even with you but he can't because you know other other Muslims would not approve of that either. Um, it's just this helplessness. So you just grab your popcorns and watch it. This is entertainment. This is free entertainment, guys. <laughs> this is. This is. My goodness. I mean, if I were hijab and I were thinking clearly for five seconds, I would say, yes, it's going to hurt to take down all these tweets and apologize to these women right now. It's going to hurt because, you know, David's been ordering me. It's going to hurt, but not nearly as bad as it's going to hurt, you know, three, four weeks from now when it's been normalized for people to, you know, well, I'm going to go into all my plans, but it's going to be pretty bad. All right. One- it, it, look, it's, 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 it's very quickly. It's very, it's very obvious that it, it is becoming normalized, but not only just that. The point is that Muslims are losing interest Mm-hmm. in trying to protect their book. Mm-hmm. Of course, that's what we say, right? We say we need to normalize dissent mm-hmm. and we need to normalize blasphemy. But you're enabling someone like David Wood with his reach, and, he's, and obviously your reach is getting amplified as well because of this drama. More and more Muslims are going to be like, yeah, okay, these people do this every day. So before you know it, even Muslims won't be outraged over this. So they wouldn't care. So, you know, thank you very much, Ijab. I think that's a long-term good benefit out of this whole thing is that that hijab has enabled us is that mm-hmm. people are just not going to care they, they become desensitized to it yeah and uh that's what's going to happen unless he really really unless they really just stop trying to thug out and start trying to negotiate some terms and <laughs> and learn how to deal with some people and so in a really nice way very quickly that's where this is headed um, but what, one, one other thing that's going to come out of this is, again, eventually when hijab is forced, not by me, he will either be forced by his own decision or he will be forced by the Muslim community to back down. When that eventually happens, um, if he makes this take a long time, uh, if he makes this take a long time, I'm going to make sure everyone knows. You see, notice, here's the most arrogant, most proud man in the entire world and you're able to control his behavior when he starts insulting and heaping abuse on women. So take note, again, you can't say, hey, stop praying or stop believing in Allah or stop doing this or stop doing that. If someone's heaping abuse on you, if someone's insulting, you can actually order a Muslim to stop and make him stop using this methodology that we find in the Muslim sources. And guys, Muslims, hijab, Ali Dawa, trust me, you don't want that method. <laughs> becoming popularized, but I will popularize it if you don't stop. Uh, All right, so we have to take off now, but one final, one final question, just because tons of people, probably most of my viewers are Christians, so they were all, lots of people were asking questions along uh, the lines of Christianity, uh, things like that, so I'd be kind of a, uh, they're going to be mad if I don't at least ask one question here. So, Harris, do you oppose Christianity I picked this one because it's interesting because I'm thinking about different kinds of uh, ex-Muslims. So it says, Harris, do you oppose Christianity? What would be your point of view on the topic? And so I think the idea here is we've got, you've got a spectrum, right? So among atheist ex-Muslims, there's kind of a spectrum. And sort of on one end, you've got like the apostate prophet who says, I don't care. I just don't, I don't care what people believe. I don't care about Christianity. I don't care about, you know, all I care, I, I just do not want Islam taking over. That's it. That's the one thing that I'm opposed to. I don't care uh, much else. And then kind of at the other end, you have, um, no, all religion is just uh, equally bad, or maybe Islam is slightly worse, but religion in general, horrible. We've got to, we've, we've got to basically convert the world to atheism. So, if uh, you know, if that's the spectrum, kind of where on that, you know, right, where right, on that would you right. be? I think I've got that. Yeah, I got that. I, I, I think I think Christopher Hitchens summed it up very nicely. He said, if he was in the 30s, if he was living in the 1930s, then he would have been opposing Christianity more than Islam because just of his alignment with. I, I know there's dis- different opinions on that too, but 
just from his point of view. And let's assume he was right, that it's, a, it's, a, it's alliance with uh, Nazi Germany. Um, then he would have been, so it's, it's all based on your situation. I mean, in our lifetime, we know Islam is the biggest demon that needs to be put back in the bottle. Um, Islam needs to be tamed. Um, but again, if I was living in a different time where let's just say Christianity was behaving as badly as Islam, then I would have been speaking against that. So in, in, in my case, I am a, I'm, I'm, I'm a very strong libertarian in that sense. I, I, I believe that people have a right to believe in whatever they want to believe in, even Muslims. I don't care. I don't care what they believe in. The problem is, unfortunately, when personal beliefs become the domain of the public, when, for example, countries like Pakistan, we've seen that, where every aspect of your legal jurisprudence is coming out of, is inspired by Islam. And then what happens? Then people start acting like thugs. Christians don't behave that way. Once, if they started behaving that way, if Western, Western Baptist Church, Westboro Baptist Church, if they became, if they were the face of Christianity, Yes, I'd be crapping on Christianity too, but to me, Christianity, my my mother, my mother goes to this church every now and then just because she found some friends. I mean, she's a Muslim, but and um, she was um, um, she, she this this lady was telling her about Jesus, and my mother was telling her about Muhammad, and my mum said, "Oh, okay, you know, like she was saying really good things about Jesus." But again, but that was it. There was no imposition that you you should you know hold this holy water. So anyway, and then my mum was saying that you know our Muslims don't act that way. Our Muslims go in that in any room they go in as if they own the joint and they have the truth on their side, and we're gonna try to convert you. Christians don't have that anymore, I would say at least. So in this society, I mean, I, I don't oppose Christianity. I would say I don't even oppose Islam in, in that sense either. My main motive is get Islam out of public life. Do, do you want to believe in Muhammad's flying donkey or whatever? Believe it in in private. Do you want to pray five or six times a day? I don't care. I really don't care. But my problem is because we know and we have evidence. We have tons of evidence. It's Muslim countries where you kill apostates legally where you kill apostates or you lynch them in a mob we have these problems we can see that from we have evidence that it it it, it gets out of control you need to tame it um and when islam becomes uh, but i think islam is, is a different demon altogether it is either a dominant it would live dominantly or it would die out there's no me middle ground for it like there is for christianity uh, christianity has found a way to to survive um, uh, in the hearts of believers and whatnot, um, uh, but it, it doesn't impose itself on you. And all, all the Western countries, all the Christian countries, are secular countries. Um, why why is why is Islam not like that? There's only one example, Turkey, and that seems like it's going back as well. well it's going so back. Islam can, yeah, Islam either dominates or it dies out. So I think if and I don't care about whether it dies out or not. As I said, I don't care if if it dies out, fine. But if otherwise, you can. Become like Christianity. Don't impose yourself on states. Don't make laws around it. Um, I don't care. All right. And uh, apart from that, I'm getting re I'm getting requests to eat the Quran. <laughs> Not going to eat the Quran in in this video, but uh, uh, you, you stay stay tuned because I will be eating the Quran again very soon. Um, I will be taking a, I mean, unless Muhammad Hijab changes his mind, but uh, yeah, I'll have an entire live stream where I take requests from viewers on which verses to eat and we'll discuss why those verses are being consumed uh, with beer. How do you digest so much crap? <laughs> gotta, I've heard of junk food, but you're taking it a holy level. <laughs> yep. You got to do it. You got to, sometimes you got to do it, but nope. Once you, once you get a taste for Quran, once you get a taste for the Quran, you start wanting it. You start wanting, uh, wanting to chew you it up more. Back. Much much more so than reading it. Um, all right. Thanks to uh, Harris Sultan. And again, the link to his YouTube channel uh, is in the description box and the link to his book on Amazon also in the description box. And uh, Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. And by the way, there are two channels. I think obviously if the audience is mostly Western, then uh, obviously just go to my English channel, which is Harris Sultan. But, but if you are from India or Pakistan, you do understand Urdu and Hindi, please go to my Pakistani Mulhit channel. That's very interesting. As I said earlier, we have had 2.5 million views. There are celebrities talking about me under their breath that people have 
without mentioning me by name. That's how. That's the. That's the double edged sword for them. If they mention Harris Sultan, then they go then, to your site. Then they go to my site, yeah. but they can't. But they can't ignore me because their fans are saying, "Look at this! Mm. Look at this apostate! He's just des- he's just blaspheming so openly." So they have to say something. So you know, this is a very exciting time, and you know, my um, yeah. So so do check out that channel as well. Uh, right, and uh, w- can they find the link to that from your English channel? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can okay. you, you can find the channel from my free feature channels. They're all there. Yeah. All right, ladies and gentlemen, so you have those links. Thanks for watching, and catch you all next time. Thank you. Ciao.